Hello and welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Nausicast. The Nausicast is where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli and discuss our analysis and research findings. Today, we're tackling a really big one, and you could say maybe the biggest or the second, big, the second biggest film by Studio Ghibli. It is, of course, Mononoke Hime, or Princess Mononoke, directed by Hayao Miyazaki in 1997. If you are at all a fan of Studio Ghibli, which I assume most of you are coming for this podcast, you know this film and you've probably seen it. With me today are my lovely co-hosts, Platon Skull. Hello. Ready to uh, see this movie with eyes unclouded. Hipster Kusulu. You know, I totally forgot. People get like straight decapitated in this movie. Pretty gnarly. Uh, oh yeah, it's fucking yeah. rough. Ziff. Hello. And new to the crew, Max. Introduce hey. yourself a little for us, will you? Hey. I'm Max, uh, also referred to as Tsukiya. And I'm a long friend of Niyad and like Mononoke is my favorite movie, so hi, I'm here. And you've seen this movie like what, fifty times? Yeah, about about fifty times. I watched that movie like several times a year. Well, at, at this point, yeah. can't you just like close your eyes and and like rewatch the whole thing in your head? Oh come <laughs> on, you can't. You gotta watch the movie with eyes unclouded. I think closed eyes are pretty much as clouded <laughs> as it can get. Damn right. I don't know. I don't know, yeah, but you when you're meditating, see, you often have your eyes closed. Though. Can you even see the movie with eyes unclouded when you've seen it for the 15th time? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to make an attempt. Yeah, and and, and also if uh, if we ever like get get as a detail wrong or a dialogue line or something wrong, uh, we have you to uh, to catch us in the act. Yeah, that's fine. I, I, Very important. I will not judge you for that. No, but the thing is that my take that I had in like. 2003, which was the first time I saw that because it was on Christmas Eve when it was first brought uh, shown in German TV. I still have the same take now. Like I watched that movie yesterday and I still have the same take. Okay, so let's get back to the film. It is a film from 1997 written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki with a cinematic release in the US in 1999. It was at the time the highest grossing Japanese film in 1997 and became the highest grossing film in Japan in general of all time, beating out the record set previously by E.T. I like uh, highest grossing of all time in Japan. That is until later in the year when Titanic, you know, also came to Japanese shores. Yeah, when Titanic fucked everything over. Uh, by the way, fun fact, we went full circle with James Cameron dethroning Miyazaki, but then when he went and made Avatar, he cited Mononoke Hime as an influence, ending up cracking that record yet again. Just uh, as an interesting little anecdote. So the movie's cinematic release in the States has an interesting history between Studio Ghibli and Disney, which we're also going to talk about. And they also got a prolific and well-known fantasy author heading the English dub script writing, which is Neil Gaiman. I think he's pretty famous, yeah? Oh, yeah. B very famous fantasy creator. Uh, if, if anyone knows, like, Good Omens, American Gods. Uh, he also wrote the, Sandman. The, the, yeah, the Sandman comics. Um He's he, he's he's a big deal, like a big name in uh, fantasy fiction. So uh, pretty pretty good get there. Um, but but yes, uh, uh, as you say, Nyad, um, uh, Mononoke Hime is the first uh, collaboration between uh, uh, Walt Disney Studios and uh, Studio Ghibli in terms of uh, adapting it for for an uh, uh, for an American release, um, which uh, has a. It's a pretty uh, interesting uh, story there because, like, Studio uh, Ghibli and spe specifically Miyazaki has been an, a huge inspiration uh, for uh, American animators since, like, at, at least the nineteen uh, seventies, uh, start started the eighties. Um, so, so, like, so, so some of um, the first uh, international, like, at least American screenings of uh, Studio Ghibli movies were like uh, private screenings uh, with, like, a uh, uh, the the uh, Pixar crew or uh, Disney Animation Studios uh, stuff like that. They they had uh, John Lasseter, uh, who later became like the biggest like champion uh, of uh, Studio Ghibli in the West. Uh, had a like a trip to um, to Studio Ghibli while they were pr uh, producing a uh, uh, My Neighbor Totoro, 
Um, unfortunately, uh, it it kind of like was a bit of a bit of a mess getting uh, getting a proper release for uh, Mononoke Hime in the in the U.S. Um, there's there's a famous anecdote that um, uh, b- 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 because uh, the powers that be at Disney were like looking to uh, th- they had like this uh, specific idea of what a like animated hit film was, and it included the word princess. And it did not like include decapitations uh, and, and and like uh, female characters with like interesting death and agency, um, but uh, so so uh, specifically like one of the people uh, involved was Harvey Weinstein, who uh, yeah who, who was like really known as like the type of meddling producer that uh, that uh, cut uh, films to pieces uh, in uh, in post production. Which I mean, he 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 had he had a lot of like success uh, with, with like getting people their Oscars and stuff, but uh, like still uh, he was known as Harvey Scissorhands by people in the know, uh, and and he wanted to cut out an entire forty five minutes. Yes, yes, it's 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 pretty insane. Um, so um, one of the uh the 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 story goes that one of the um animators no no one of the producers at at Studio Ghibli. Um, I, I I forget his name off the top of my head. Is it uh, Suzuki? I think. Yeah, Toshio Suzuki. Uh, yeah, uh, sent him like sent him a katana, like an actual Japanese katana, with a note on it saying "No cuts." Holy shit! Yeah. <laughs> like why do you why do like... you send someone something that's specifically for cutting, but then tell them not to cut? <laughs> kind of a Kind of a weird choice. It, 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 it's a bit of a, it, it's quite a power move though. And, and, and it actually like, maybe it worked or maybe like things are more complicated, but at any rate, it did get a release, but it was a limited release in the fall uh, with a kind of like uh, uneven marketing campaign. So it didn't like, it didn't really become the big breakthrough for uh, for Studio Ghibli uh, in the US. That would come later, as you mentioned with Spirited Away um, after John Lasseter uh, Again, a co-founder of uh, Pixar and biggest uh, Studio Ghibli fan, and uh, an executive producer on most uh, Ghibli uh, films, uh, like for for the US release, uh, he he really like be, be became a more powerful figure. Um, so yeah, that's uh, we, we'll probably get a bit more into that with uh, Spirited Away uh, winning the Academy Award and stuff. To get a little bit to the production cycle of the film, and it has been mentioned in two casts so far, this film came into existence during the production of On Your Mark and Whisper of the Heart. So uh, if you want to reference those casts for more details on that. Also in this time frame, Miyazaki finished the Nausicaa. Uh, also in this time frame, Miyazaki finished the Nausicaa manga. And this film's production is also the origin of one of the most well-known legends about Miyazaki. And that is that he himself hand-checked and oversaw 144,000 cells during the production of this film. And that he has partially or completely redrawn at least 80,000 of them. This myth is somewhat, uh, well... This myth is kind of what really cemented his reputation as an absolute workhorse. And it's hard to know how much of it is true, but it persists anyways. Yeah, it's, it's also part of the reason why he, uh, he, he declares his, his uh, retirement for, I think, the first time after uh, finishing this movie. Um, like, also influenced by, uh, by, by his, uh, his, his friend uh, Kondo's uh, death, uh, which we talk about in... Yeah. Yeah, which we talk about in the Whisper of the Heart cast. So go check that out. It doesn't have enough use. Look at it. Yeah, th- 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 that aside, it's uh, it's important to know that this is definitely still like uh, the work of a whole studio of uh, co- uh, like talented collaborators. Um, th- th- this th- this movie, which uh, had a th- uh, a budget of three billion yen, which is I uh, uh, as I read about like thirty million dollars um, in uh, in um, like American money at the time, uh, not adjusted for inflation, and uh, a third of that budget went directly to to the CG, which is also a big part of the movie. It's the first uh, Studio Ghibli movie that like really incorporated CG in a major way. Uh, like we, we we've we've seen and discussed like a few smaller shots in a couple earlier movies that uh, that use uh, computer effects, but uh, th- this is the first like major release, um, and it was also like. At the same time, was also the last 
a Ghibli film uh, made on traditional cell animation. Because literally they seem to have run into an issue where they would literally run out of cells because they couldn't like buy enough to, to sustain them uh, at times. It seems that at, at this time the industry had a huge shift where actually like the, the cells, the literal cells weren't produced enough anymore to cover some big production like this. So yeah, it's very and, interesting. So there was actually and, and, and a the, lot of very the, digitally composed imagery and like straight up digital Im imagery blended with like traditional cell animation. It's re really interesting. Yeah, I believe for the uh, big like um, leech snake covered monster at the beginning, they they like made a model of all the individual like wriggling snakes and stuff over it, and then had the animators like paint over that footage they had. So it still like looks like it's animated traditionally and the same style of coloring, but like it's done in a way that would have been impractical to try to animate traditionally. So it gives it this kind of. It also gives the, the the monster this kind of like uncanny effect, which I think works a lot because it's supposed to be this kind of unholy, evil presence that isn't like anything else mm. in the film. So the way Miyazaki in, in Turning Point talks about this himself is that they had at first like attempted to make the entire uh, 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 leech covered boar. He was trying to make that entire leech covered boar like straight up in CG. He didn't like the results, and then he had his team of young animators and told him, okay. You take this, what we have, and you do it. And and then he like spoke admiringly about all these key animators involved into animating this absolute marvel because it does seem to be that CG is kind of like the inspirational basis for it, but it's not like what we see in the film is actually not literally CG. It's actually like drawn uh, by hand for, by all these crazy animators that he praised so much because, yeah, I can imagine that he would go mad drawing all these wiggling worms and it looks incredible. Yeah. Another interesting uh, uh, little fa fact about the production that I stumbled upon, uh, th this movie had uh, five art directors, which w was like, uh, was and I think still is like kind of unheard of for uh, for, for uh, animated films in Japan. Uh, like Laputa had two and that was fucking uh, a lot. Um, so so, so uh, you had like one art director in charge of uh, Ashitaga's uh, village at the, at the beginning, one who's in charge of uh iron town one who's in, in charge of uh like the, the forest uh i think so um so, so, so yeah like the, the the largeness of the production and the uh the the, the lavishness of like uh spending a third of your budget on uh on like state-of-the-art uh cg animation and combining it with this uh the studio like known and renowned for traditional animation like it, it had a big uh like like uh part of the, the movie's appeal for the Japanese audience. But I have to say, like this being one of the first movies to strongly utilize CG animation, it is also one of the most seamless and fucking flawless implementations yeah, of CG still animation holds up I've ever today. seen. It holds up completely and also like at some scenes, you would have to tell me twice to, to, that I would recognize that CG happened. Like, I see the CG happening when it's like the image composition or when it's like a perspective shot, like during the action scenes when like the landscape around uh, Ashitaka running, for example, or San running warps. And you tell, okay, you can tell this is CG, of course. But in so many other ways, it's done subtly in such ways that it blends perfectly. And it's stunning. Like, I, I, I'm a big... I'm a big critic of like a lot of uh, usages of CG in anime because it's often poorly implemented. But this is absolutely not the case uh, with with this movie. It's it's really good. And it's 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 not just like uh, technically well implemented. It's also thoughtfully used at, at, at the right times. Like as, as aside from a few like uh, uh, shots where like running, uh, you see a perspective of someone like riding uh, an elk or a horse, and you see the. Uh, ground most of the cg like, like the big cg effects are all like the magical uh moments uh like we mentioned before the the uh the, the weird squiggly wormy curse uh things on uh, on the uh on the board demon god uh the the of, of course the the night walkers uh sequence the way uh it it, it glows from the inside stuff like that it, it it's often used for specifically otherworldly uh parts of the movie which is which is a way to like make this um less natural looking thing feel more appropriate uh in the moment well, well of course they still did uh work their asses off to, to make it integrated into the movie's aesthetic Besides from the uh, uh, computer animated stuff, uh, there's another interesting thing like related to the, well, not production, but like years after the production of Mononokuhima, which is that in 2012, it was announced that there's a collaboration between Studio Ghibli and the British theater company, uh, the, 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 the British theater company called Whole Hawk Theater, 
that they would be adapting Princess Mononoko to the stage, which is the first stage adaptation of a Studio Ghibli work. And yeah, the contract between uh, Whole Hog Theatre and uh, Studio Ghibli was uh, set up and facilitated, and they staged the play multiple times. So I don't know if you can still catch the play or see a recording of it somewhere, but I thought it worth mentioning to see that, yeah, we have Studio Ghibli stage plays. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Man, I mean, this this uh, podcast is not complete until we get tickets for that and talk yeah, about it. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Something tells me the action won't be quite as satisfying as in the movie. Oh, oh probably. Yeah. Um, I, l- I this, love the, the action in the in this film. Yeah, I think that's actually an interesting production thing to mention as well. The uh, typically Miyazaki's action in the way that he stages sequences throughout um, all of the other movies he's made previously are like quite fantastical and remind me of kind of like older kind of cinema like a bit maybe indiana jones and the stuff that inspired that where it's like these big kind of fun spectacle things as you go through like a building or whatever and um uh, things are slowly getting destroyed and it maintains kind of like this cinematic distance i would say particularly in lapita i feel like a lot of the sequences in that feel um really like classical style cinema but in this to betray kind of the more like animalistic and like nature like um uh parts of the character particularly san we get these incredibly like tight close action sequences where she's running about super fast and like cutting at people in these really like aggressive movements i feel like it lends a lot to the personality of the film yeah. which of course as we yeah, mentioned definitely. before like the really brutal parts where like people just get straight decapitated or their arms just fly apart and it really lends itself something to the, like the uh the historical note that this movie is a part of and also kind of the uh the real world parallel it creates yeah like th- this is the this is the most uh like uh serious uh of miyasaki's films uh so far uh, uh, like along with uh nausicaa of the valley of the wind which is uh had us a lot of things in common with which we'll obviously discuss um but but yeah i i definitely agree there's there's something like so like visceral and grounded uh in in, in the action sequences uh in, in the movie in the fight scenes spe- specifically uh and the way it like incorporates uh, these like su- uh, superhuman uh, feats of strength and agility, uh, especially from uh, Ashitaka with his uh, like uh, the, the curse giving him like supernatural strength, and uh, and when with San having like uh, ridiculous reflexes and speed, uh, it, it it's 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 really well done, and it's also using the animated format uh, in a really cool way because a lot of the 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 combat and the action. Is filled with impo- impossibly close calls, uh, like people d- like dodging arrows by millimeters and, uh, and 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 like elegantly dancing around someone's uh, uh, blade, wh- which is like something that's really really difficult, if not impossible, to accomplish with uh, with stunt work, at least at, at the like speed and intensity that, that it is here. So it's a way of like uh, using the advantage of the control you have in animation uh, for for. Uh, to elevate the the uh, like h- historical action genre in a way. And listen, I'm not easily caught by by action scenes. Like I'm not like one who's like the the main person who's like an action movie goer who's thrilled by the spectacle. But holy shit, this movie grabs you by the balls. Like when there's an action scene, you, and this is one of the main feats they've aided by CG so well, which is like running, which is like backgrounds, like moving in in like, like proper ways, like proper camera movement in in specific scenes where like you use have like Zan, Zan running into the camera and like you pull back and everything is happening and holy shit that movement and that gets me that that got me a lot so wow yeah Ooh, no, i did not, not expect it, this and it's, and it's not just in, in the, like the flashy sequences like the uh like the bombs exploding and uh and giant balls falling out of the sky and stuff like that i i i, I think the um the, the sequence where uh, San infiltrates Iron Town and yeah, attacks Lady Boshi. Fuck. The the tension in the moment where where, where like uh, the the whole town is gathered to protect Lady uh, Lady Boshi and San is standing like at the at the top of the big uh, you know uh, ironwork uh, building. Like the the tension before she starts running down the roof. That, that that's that's cinema right there. Uh, but we, we'll we'll get more into uh, the technical aspects of uh, the filmmaking later. Also, one thing I've noticed, uh, I don't know if you've noticed it, is that the, the, the action is very invigorating, but at the same time, at certain points, it feels weirdly mundane, as if it's like, um, you know, you just shoot someone's arm off, you know, oh, that just happened here, it's not a big deal. Or, no, it is a big deal, but it like, feels like very 
yeah mundane in the way that it feels like it's for the characters it's a very normal everyday occurrence that happens even though it's like still very traumatic yeah i noticed that right at the beginning of the film uh right after we have the whole big fight with the uh, the the boar uh, when uh, Ashitaka is traveling, we see a bunch of like samurais like slaughtering a village, and the first shot is this really pulled back shot of just a bunch of villagers running away, and a couple of them just being slaughtered by samurai, and it's shown like so flatly and matter of factly, and just something that's happening off in the distance, like sets such a great tone for kind of the historical period that this was in, of just like these these wandering bands of samurai just destroying this village and like people kind of just dying by whatever and it's 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 kind of like supposed to be like really horrible and people getting their arms cut off but it's done in such a removed way that it really sets yeah. the stage of it Miyazaki talked about this a bit too in, in Turning Point when he uh, uh, mentions uh, the fact that he doesn't want to depict violence very honestly and as a part of like the human condition as such like that violence is, pre is present everywhere also nature which we're going to get to in our thematic analysis later on in this podcast a little bit more uh, but like this yeah absolutely he actually defended this decision to include this degree of violence and even said well despite all this violence or, or maybe even because of the, all this violence and how it is depicted I w still want this to be a movie viewed by children and for children like he explicitly talked about the idea of okay i know it's violence i know it's, it's 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 horrible but i think like elementary school kids he said would be a good recipient for this because this is a way to teach them about what violence is like what it means and how, yeah, how that, violence is like part of everything yeah that, uh, that, that actually makes sense like there's a lot of blood in this movie but like it, it, it's not like someone gets the arm chipped off and like blood starts gushing out of it like, and fucking raining all over the place like it's kill or kill or something <laughs> I guess, yeah, it's pretty selective about when like we really see like the flowing uh blood especially like later scenes with with the wounded giant gods it's pretty it's pretty metal <laughs> yeah, it, yeah in some ways it feels weirdly like neat and satisfying it's like oh he shot this guy's head off oh that was pretty satisfying to watch it's like <laughs> i don't know yeah i don't I, know if yeah. you felt that I think there's there's an element to which uh, violence in this movie also oozes some kind of fascination to us or is supposed to draw us to certain things and consider them. Because, I mean, fundamentally, every single character is committing violence to some capacity. Uh, except maybe Ashitaka. He's like the person who is like most consistently not engaged in actively committing violence. Well, I mean, he does decapitate a samurai with an, a stone arrow. However, it is in defense. Let's be real. Okay? Yeah, yeah, it, it <laughs> is mean, in self-defense, but it's still he, pretty hardcore. I mean, at at every on. point when he's fighting the samurai, he's like, back off, don't attack me. And and, and then he says, ah, ah, and, and Ashitaka just shoots his head off. That's what you do. Sorry. But well, yeah, <laughs> when he actually he fights that samurai, that's actually a really great moment because uh, that's the first point which we realize is that his, um, his arm is like super enhanced by the curse. And he didn't realize he was firing his bow that strong to like cut the dude's arms clean off. Also, so it's yeah, also the thematically works yeah. in because like the curse of hatred upon him is like making him stronger and like making what maybe would have been just an arrow shot to disarm the guy just t total his yeah, arm he was, completely. Yeah, he, he, he did hit his sword, but like the force just like ripped uh, his arms off. Like you, you see the, the arrow like pins the sword to a tree, uh, and, and but the... Uh, Oh, oh, I think maybe it was a pole arm, uh, but, but like the, the, the arms are like dangling off. It's again, like pre pretty violent, uh, but, but like not, uh, but, but in, in a way that's like uh, a, a seven year old watching it be like, whoa, <laughs> like, whoa, but, not, not, I, not be disturbed by it, but be like, holy crap. What yeah, an I think it is quite a pointed watch. thing that Ashitaka, like almost every single part of the film tries everything he can to stop violence from going down. Yes, like yes, he'll he'll true. he'll really exhaust his options until he sometimes has to strike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like like I literally remember my my eleven year old who was like uh, seeing that scene, which was by the way not centered on the German TV, which was kind of interesting. And I wasn't like, oh man, he's a violent evil person. Or like I got the idea that like, he like he didn't want to to attack him, but they attacked him, so he needed to defend himself. And the scene itself was kind of brutal, but I I did not feel like like it was unnecessary brutal back then i mean it's not so, yeah. very gory right it's not like yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of the senses it's not like it is very violent and you see people's heads fall off and stuff but like uh, i mean part of this point has already been made but like it's like very like neat and, like um not like only going to the extent that it is necessary to communicate the violence and not 
going the extra step to do the shock value that a lot of directors often fall into, I think. Yeah. But this, this might be a, like the, the only time I, I, be, I just want to give a quick shout out to some of the smartest characters in this movie. Um, the, the, the nameless uh, samurai horseman uh, chasing Ashitaka, who, when they see their fucking uh, the fellow swordsman get de- decapitated by an arrow from like uh, 400 yards away, they turn around and they're like, nope, out of there. Yep. Uh, <laughs> that's a <laughs> smart move. Like, de-escalation Absolutely. is always rewarded in this movie. Dude, I, I mean, I just wanted to get a little bit to explain, like, what the fuck are those samurai doing there? Why are they just, like, one background element and then, like, disappear? Like, this is, like, important for the historical context. But in this historical context, we're going to talk about Seven Samurai a little bit. And holy shit, nobody in Seven Samurai ever backs up. Like, this this backing up is unusual. Like, you can get slaughtered to, to fuck, but nobody's backing up in Seven Samurai. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's really interesting. Yeah, you, yeah, have, you guess... have a, like, n- not necessarily, like, he, he isn't a pacifist, but he he, he does, like, uh, Ashitaga does, uh, like, uh, believe in nonviolence. Uh, like, it's it's a, like, he's pretty good at it. Uh, you know the whole violence thing. I mean, it's is a, it's just, I mean, it's yeah, just okay. trade. He's great at violence, <laughs> but I I just thought you said he's good at non-violence because holy shit, that, that oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's good at violence. Um, I don't know. He definitely tries for it. Like even the opening sequence, I think, says so much about his character. Where like there's this rampaging demon just heading right for his hometown, and, and he's he tries like it, right? he's yeah he's trying to reason with it. He's like, come on, dude, step away from from this. Like everything until like the last moment in which one of the girls running away falls down, and he sees that there's no option, so he just has to fire. Oh, which is also fantastic world building because like the entire nature of how these people there treat the 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 giant boar. And like later Ashitaka's like, oh, they have Kodama here too. So we implied that back where he lives, there's also Kodama and uh, like the, the forest birds, right? So we have this like sense of world building that these people that he's been living with have a like really, really like uh, 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 sensitive relationship with uh, the nature spirits. Like when the boar is being buried, like, oh, dear boar, we're burying your body. Please don't hate us. And then the boar's like, fuck you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I th- honestly, I think a uh, little background detail I also noticed that I felt uh, really strongly symbolizes the difference between uh, Ashitaka's people and the people of Iron Town is that um, we see in the beginning this like these little r- tiny little roadways between the big fields and like rice patches. So like, their entire influence on their environment is like as minimal as possible. They walk these little streets in between these big spread out fields. And then of course the exact opposite of Iron Town is this massive thing built on a hill with the entire landscape around it just decimated yeah. and completely like uh, destroyed for their own purposes. Absolutely. Damn. I, th- I think this might be a good uh, time to get into like so- some some of the uh the, the inspirations and, uh, and historical context of, uh, of of the setting, like yeah. spe- speaking of Ashitaka's tribe. Exactly. Speaking of Samson Rai too. Um, yeah. So in a sense, this movie obviously is somewhat historical. I mean, there's fantasy elements, there's spirits that are brought to life. There's a lot of um, made up stuff in there too, about different cultures and a lot of anachronism. But let me like start at the beginning. So uh, Ashitaka's tribe, is the Emishi people. And I think, Ipsa, you looked at some stuff about the Emishi. So oh, yeah. Do you want me yeah. to just give like a cursory, yeah. bastardized yeah. history that I've discovered? Okay, so basically, from all the sources I get gathered, there's starts out uh, in Japan, in Japanese history, there's the uh, Jomon people that were like the indigenous people in like way back, like around about 300 BC is they when they're like last dated for being around. And then they split into various different ethnic groups like the Emishi. And then when uh, Yai... Yayao settlers, I think that's how you say it, Yayoi. came from like mainland Korea over to Japan in around about like uh, 300 BC, around about maybe like the t- the turn of the mer- the millennium there. That is when um, Japan became far more like culturally homogenous in the sense that there was like becoming a larger ethnic group of like the indigenous people mixing with the Koreans until you get the uh, the current Yamato people that like would be the the dominant ethnic group of current Japan. And the, the Imaishi, or the Imaishi, um, are kind of uh, slowly pushed out throughout history. Like, they kind of existed up until around about the 11th century, I think. And um, they're basically like a small tribe that's, yeah, like characterized here as these kind of like land-loving indigenous people with very minimal impact on their environment. 
and they were slowly kind of like ethnically discriminated against in real life and as we see in this movie where they're like pushed yeah. away and chased out by the uh, the larger hem- hegemony, uh, hegemony of the, yeah. the main Japanese culture at the time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's mentioned in the movie that like the, the, the emperor like a, a cast, the, cast them away uh, for, like uh, they had to like flee further eastward. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just said that it was like hundreds of years ago too that they were cast away and they were like still yeah. referencing like the idea, oh yeah, the lands in the West, something awful is and going the, on there. And the, the the tribe was dying out, like n- yeah. not just like physically, but also like spiritually in a way. Which is um, huge, right? Because like when they have to send Ashitaka away, you realize in all their face of sadness and oh, this this young heir that was supposed to take over our tribe is now having to leave. Yeah, and, and like a... a, a, a beautiful like uh, handsome gorgeous uh, wonder boy that, that that would like get a bunch of ladies i mean so it's he was gonna get laid <laughs> it is interesting that was the plan about, as like go ahead uh, because i kind of wanted to add, add on like the history of the mishi because i also had this in the university and there actually there is a lot that's not known about the mishi oh, yeah. because all, all writing about them is basically from the side of the Japanese people. So basically it is kind of classified as an ethnic group, yes, but it's kind of unclear if the Amishi are actually like their very like own ethnic group or if they're just like a different kind of clan or like a social unit that's kind of separate from uh, what was then known as the Yamato uh, people. Um, because they were just kind of described as like barbarians and outsiders and enemies, uh, but it wasn't really like the, I don't know, I guess there's also D- some DNA evidence and stuff, but like um, it, basically all that's known is that they, they were these like kind of northerners that uh, kind of got described from the Yamato people, but they're very mysterious because there's, they didn't write or anything. It's just like, um, their history has been entirely defined by uh, what is now the dominant Japanese history from the side of like the yeah. the Yamato emperors. Um, yeah, what's interesting yeah. about this is that uh, Miyazaki, look, because usually you would expect like after big movies release, he would go into interviews and talk with like movie people and animation people. But instead, like if you read Turning Point, there's plenty of interviews that he did with anthropologists and historians. And he's talking about very, very contemporary research findings and is discussing them with with those people and he's like yeah this book that uh, changed my mind or like gave me a new perspective on japanese history and this book that told me about the emi- uh, 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 emishi people which which i had never heard much about and so on and so on so he very he took this research very very seriously but also like because you basically you do not know how they dressed and what the customs of the emishi were it's all lost so what miyazaki did was like take all these accounts and like compare it with like indigenous peoples around the world and like gather inspiration of how does he want to make them dress and everything like the entire culture depicted there is something miyazaki kind of came up with to try to fill this sense of what the Emishi people might have looked like. And this is all feeding into his big attempt, and this is also something he talked about with the historians, to try and make a movie about the people that would usually be excluded from the historical stages in in other films and, and media about historical periods. So it is set in the late Muromachi period, which was from 1336 to 1573, somewhere in there. But it has a couple of anachronisms. Like the Mishi people, obviously, as far as we've heard, are supposed to be already gone at this point or, or rather disappeared. I mean, we see them disappearing in the movie, basically. I mean, it feels like Ashitaka going is somewhat of a death sentence to them. But also, like, the ironworks. This is also very, according to Miyazaki, not something that is very often displayed or explored in the context of historical uh, period pieces of Jidai Geki, the, the, these movies that we associate with like the samurai and peasants and like the feudal lords and everything, which just seems to suggest the history of Japan that is entirely comprised of like the aristocracy of the uh, samurai lords and so on and so on, rather than to, to show that there's actually a ton of different kind of communities, ethnicities that are sort of excluded from the mainstream historical dialogue about all the cultural understanding of Japan's history. Yeah, and uh, and, and also like um, uh, th- this is like is said like early Muromachi w- w- when um, w- when the forests were like j- just beginning to, to like really like like the, the clearing of uh, old forest was just like uh, getting getting started to make room for like the the rice paddies to feed a growing uh, population, and it's also like uh, like an an era uh, associated with like. 
uh, the, the samurai taking up like a, a, a more noble function in society and, and like the de- developments in in art like like traditional tea ceremonies no theater uh, that kind of stuff uh but but like th- this this movie's not interested in that shit like like the samurais in this movie <laughs> are like uh, bandits and uh, and hired warriors yeah, yeah i think the most like telling part of the whole like historical perspective of this movie is the one scene where the uh the the, the noble samurai um send like a messenger to the fort and he's like you know traditionally it'd be a cool scene in a movie where he comes in and they have a, a big discussion about the, the the war that's currently happening but he's turned away at the gates by a bunch of women who are all ex-prostitutes and then they fire a gun at him and tell him to piss off and that like <laughs> that really sum- yeah. summarizes like the kind of historical perspective that this movie is going at it really like summarizes this, uh, it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. But it also does seem to be the case that, like, historically, as as far as like these interviews, uh, uh, this dialogues that Miyazaki had with these historians in these uh, pages in Turning Point, so they they also talked about the fact that yeah, iron works tend to be extremely outsider based communities. They are actually like 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 almost like frontier settlements. Like uh, if we like talk about the expansion westwards in the US, right? They're like people carving their paths through nature and just putting their little shelters somewhere often like people shunned by society one thing deviates a bit from the historical narrative about like the ironworks though and that is women uh, there was actually the conception in japanese ironworks that they uh, that women spoil the iron which is also referenced in the movie when like uh, the the guys are just going oh i don't know how to feel about the women they spoil the iron and the women just don't give a shit <laughs> because of course lady boshi is like uh, uh, the, the the best in in for them like the best community taking care of all these outsiders ex prostitutes lepers everything yeah, it's, it's like oh we spoil the iron i mean t- tell that to all the people we've shot and killed i mean <laughs> yeah basically. yeah there's there's a great line where they're like um what do, like you women should be respectful to us men you know we're the ones who brought you the rice and they're like we're the ones who made the iron so you could buy that rice so you don't get to you don't get to chat shit to us like that yeah, and and it really goes to show that it's like a community of excluded people. Like all those people, history is not particularly blessing. It is prostitutes, like really lower class women. It is lepers, like those which are looked down upon as disgusting and disfigured and completely excluded, otherwise condemned to a fate of begging in the streets and you know not much else. Yeah, they're like basically the people who are othered by society, right? They're kind of like the the unhuman or like the humanized humans actually where um and this also feeds into the kind of motivation of eboshi um where i would describe her very much as like a humanist where um she's like very sort of positive about like the the equality of like all humans and what like uh like yeah basically what human what a human doesn't matter like how limited by their social standing or like marginalization can like accomplish, I guess. And this is one of the aspects in which Miyazaki talking about Seven Samurai, by the way, like in in multiple interviews, this film came up. He was like specifically talking about the idea that he watched Seven Samurai and was like, well, I really like this movie. It says a lot about class uh, in historical Japan, but you know what? It still focuses mainly on samurai. It's a bit similar, but but I need to uh, uh, put forward a more nuanced uh, t- take on the history of Japan and uh, class and the relation to other marginalized groups that are never depicted. And this is his yeah. reaction to it. And this, I mean, it, it shares a couple of common themes. I mean, we see kind of a, sam- uh, a Seven Samurai kind of like situation happening in the background with a village yeah, like being it's raided. It's really funny. It's almost as if like the Seven Samurai and, and this film are in the same world, which is kind of like focused on different like conflicts in different places, with different themes going on. Whereas like you kind of see some stuff like that going on in the village where like some samurai bandits raid a village and like kill a bunch of people. But it's not the focus on the story. It's like, it feels like uh, what happened in, in the Seven Samurai uh, could easily have taken place in the world of Mononoke Hime, but like, well, no, it just doesn't want to focus on that at all. It wants to focus on something yeah. completely different. And it is d- depicting the background. It is depicting the times, which are very war-torn times. You could almost like say civil war, kind of like, because villages could just hire like groups of uh, s- samurai to attack other villages. And those would then hire samurai to seek redemption and revenge or whatever. And it's just like this incredible like warfare that is like just happening this violent that is omnipresent everywhere whereas like these communities for example uh, lady boshi's community is extremely tight and drawn together and like communal in a sense 
Yeah, and it's, it's, it's another way that uh, Miyazaki like plays with uh, with historicity and and with the uh, common conceptions of of Japanese history is uh, like like um, it, it it it's only like uh, a couple of centuries into the Muromachi period that we get the uh, uh, Sengoku Jidai, which is like the the uh, period of the Warring States, which is like what everyone knows uh, from like. Uh, from uh, from Japanese uh, history, even though they don't know, they know it. It's, it's the part with all the samurai lords uh, fighting over who gets to like control the capital. Uh, this big like uh, century and a half ish of, of like civil war. Um, this this is like uh, the time period here is supposed to be like before that happens, but it's still like so clear that th- there's all we're already like war going on. Uh, it's just like it's happening to the peasants, so it didn't get written down that much. Yeah. Also, it's like it was a very gradual development. What I learned in my history class is that like um, there was. Okay, this is a long time ago, but I think at this point there was the the shogunate, right? Who was like um, one of the later shogunates. But at this point, like just before the the uh, the the Sengoku Jidai, the last shogunate actually had a very like hard time actually like uh getting control over all of japan like almost immediately um they were kind of like very limited in their power in that like the local daimyo had like way more power than the the shogunate and this kind of gradually like developed into this horrible like warlord situation um and i guess this is kind of where you can see like kind of that transition because there is like a sort of centralized government but there's multiple references in the film where it seems like this centralized government is really like collapsing and like really struggling to um project their power onto their uh their formal border borders um so i think that's really interesting in how it like frames the time that's very much like in transition and in progress yeah with a lot of like different antagonisms i, I mean we also see like together. We're going to talk about this a bit more when we get to the thematic stuff, but we also like the only invocation of like the emperor that we really get is he's off screen and he's sending a samurai to get the iron town and get the head of the god, like both of these things. So what like we have this, 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 this emperor trying to consolidate power and like fuck with both parties that we have otherwise, like the iron town and the nature god. Uh, and, that, and that's really cool. Like, uh, like the whole idea that this... We could almost call it desperate, but also still very powerful and threatening like, attempt to consolidate power and to consume these two consum- communities into something else. Yeah, but it, it's also really like the feeling that this is like kind of past, past, this is kind of like a desperate attempt at getting something back that used to be very powerful, but is really on a decline now. And is really like, um, it's really like a sort of get desperate grab to get something back that used to be there. Um, and uh, I think it does quite great parallels with the uh, the side of nature, because I think the, what the film does really well and bringing up these kind of uh, historical connotations is the way that it poses the uh, the god spirits, where we have the different clans like the apes, the boars, the wolves, and they all feel like just different human tribes, like within the context of the story, just fighting over their land. Like we sh- we sh- we see equally that the apes and the boars are, are quite stupid, like the emperor, and they're like desperately trying to cling on to what they think is theirs, and they go in this like cease uh, this ceaseless charge against the enemy, knowing that it's kind of hopeless and a trap, but just like their pride carries them at the- on this death march. Yeah, um, I I I I think like it, it's it's so fascinating to me le- learning all all these things about the the origin of uh, Prince Mononoke and, and the. Uh, and and the ideas Miyazaki had about it in terms of like representation and historicity, like be, because this is like one of the biggest blockbuster hits uh, of of this nation's history, and it's about and uh, it, it it's about indigenous and marginalized uh, people struggling with uh w- with their place uh in uh in the land they live in. I mean it's it's, it's like it's like kind of like it's quietly radical in a way yeah um like like yeah. It, it, like imagine if if avatar had 
imagine if Avatar had actually been about, you know, I- I- indigenous Americans and not like blue people as stand in for uh, indigenous Americans. Yeah, that's funny. As I said, it's really like about like a, a very like transitional period um, wherein a lot of like different developments are taking place. Um, and there's just like some some old like power like uh desperately uh yeah trying to preserve that like old way even though it's like kind of doomed to fail it feels it feels also very relevant to our current times because like it kind of feels like how donald trump feels to current like <laughs> society <laughs> i don't know um um i i, I mean yeah, you're, you're pointing in the right direction. I mean, uh, climate change is the big one. Like, like uh, the idea yeah. that um, there's a conflict between uh, humanity and human industriousness and power, uh, and then like uh, the natural world and its uh, survival. Uh, that that's pretty central to uh, to the zeitgeist uh, of today. Um, so, so, so like th- th- this movie has, in a way, like only grown more uh, relevant and uh, layered as time went on. Yeah, but because like it feels like it's it's kind of like dealing with our current like transition and our current like the the liminal space that we're in right now by looking back at history and looking at a different kind of transitionary phase and kind of um, seeing what kind of like lessons or I guess like themes can be drawn from that to kind of be relevant to today but not just make it like very blatant like oh look these people were caring for their environment so we should do that too <laughs> um, yeah yeah and um, i think that's really interesting yeah I, th- like, I think also if you if you look at uh if you look at it compared to um, miyasaki's other works like he he's obviously a huge uh, environmentalist and when we've been on about that like for almost every episode about his films um but i i, I think that this uh, this one strikes a kind of different chord because uh if, if you look at uh nausicaa of the valley of the wind if you look at uh laputa um like, like, like the, uh, there's obviously this conflict between uh between nature and humanity but like it's presented in a way like human. It's more in the context of like nuclear weapons. Like you see, you see the uh, the reawakened god in Nausicaa like blasting things to pieces and having already it's already post apocalyptic. And of course, like the weapon in the the castle. But here, it's um like it, it, it it's it's historical. Like it's obviously heightened. Like like the 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 level of uh, technology with the guns is kind. Of, it's sort of a, 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 a historic. It's pretty early for that uh, stuff. Yeah. Uh, in Japan, and, and and also obviously like with the nature gods, that side is also like heightened to a fantastic level, but but still it's it's positing that like no, it's not just like the big world destroying specific weapons and inventions. It's it, it's it's like the very nature of uh, yeah of, nature of, of human exploitation of the land, but also nature in itself is violent and destructive in a sense. Like there's often this, and this is like like a huge thing that happens in environmentalist like ideology today. Well, of course, we're we're all support of envir- environmentalism, but there's also this narrative of like, oh, you just gotta live in harmony with nature. There's a balance that can be struck where everything is equal and we give and take. And this movie shows us nature is not harmonious and imbalanced. Nature is full of catastrophe. There will be earthquakes that will shatter everything, and you did not cause the earthquake. There will be floods. There can be thunderstorms. Miyazaki talks about this very openly as his like in turning point, as his attempt in this movie to show that nature is inherently violent, will burst out, will be destructive itself. That nature, in itself, will be uh, causing this violence. It is not just that humans have made unstable what is naturally harmonious but there's inherent violence to it and this is one of his main theses too in this film which we're no doubt going to talk about more but he stresses that one of his main points is that there's this narrative that oh nowadays industrialization modernized society only the last 50 years we have started destroying the earth ruthlessly and so on he's like no the very conflict, the very fact of human existence in itself is a constant state of war with nature. Humans trying to claim their place, nature trying to retain its place and being extremely chaotic and unpredictable. And, you know, there we are. This is the deadlock that we're facing. And important to consider is that this film is also in the context of one of the biggest earthquakes in Japanese history after the big earthquake in 1923, I believe, which was uh, the the... 
God, what was it called? The Great Kanto Earthquake in in in, in 1995, 1996, some, somewhere around there. Like very recently, a huge earthquake had devastated Japan. And obviously this informs the sense of nature's inherent destruction and violence. Yeah, like the movie begins with like what, like an almost like natural disaster with the with the demon arriving at the village. Uh, uh, the the tower, uh, the, the uh, lookout tower falling over. Uh, like it, it's yeah, I, I, I could I could definitely see that. I I'm not sure if the I Kobe entirely, earthquake. Like, sorry, the Kobe yeah. earthquake, the Great Kanto okay. earthquake was 1923. Right. Uh, so, but I'm not sure I agree with the whole like. Um, uh, like, like nature being being an aggressor in in, in some way. I, I, I think obviously no, 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 not, like not an aggressor, but violent and chaotic and uncontrollable. Oh 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 yeah, de- definitely. But but I th- I think what's like some of the one of the most fascinating things about the, this movie is the way that nature is depicted, not as uh, like and that's what you're getting into here, like not as this like perfect thing that we have to protect. Like in you know I think like Fern Gully. Uh, came out r- around the same time uh, this uh, D- Don Bluth animated movie that's just like all about like how magical and pure and perfect the rainforest is and how all the evil people want to take it away. I mean that that kind of simplicity is pretty common, especially in children's mm-hmm. media. Um, but at the same time, it's not uh, like as, as a straight up aggressor that we have to tame uh, and have to overcome. It's it's a neutral force. It's it just is. Uh, yeah. I think the forest yeah, like I said, really I, I really that. appreciate the way that the movie frames each of the parties and like groups of this like factional conflict as pretty much like justified in what they're doing, and like all of them, like from their perspective, are totally in the right. Like the the forest spirits want the the fo- the woods they used to live in back. The humans need it to survive. Uh, so everyone's kind of like in an equal way, and and even the forest spirits of the different tribes like conflict with each other. Like the apes and the boars would take on the wolves probably if they thought they could. So it's not like nature exists in this harmony. It exists as like just different forces trying to grab power. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, uh, but much of the greatness of this movie is really in the in the moral ambiguity, which we'll uh, like obviously be diving deeper into. Yeah. Uh, but 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 I I I I really want to talk about this movie just just from a film craft perspective, uh, if, if if we could. Uh, I, d- yes. I don't know if we have more like background stuff to get into. Um, I think I think we can go to the film tech- for, 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 to the craft side of things. Yeah, be, be, be because like um, I like like uh, for, for for the most part, like re- rewatching this uh, movie, uh, a, a lot of the thematic stuff was obviously like strength, but but m- most of it like what was already there the first time I watched it. But what I really has to start have noticed is just how amazingly like. Uh, tightly constructed this movie is it's just it's just absolutely phenomenal i, th- I think it's the uh, most i think it's the most well directed uh, of miyazaki's works uh, that we've seen up till now just um there's, there's not a single bit of fat on this movie it does like uh, like what a three-hour epic would do in like two hours and change um and uh, and and i think the whole um moral ambiguity and understanding the different sides is like uh, an integral part of the movie's construction like uh, uh, like after the um uh, after the uh, f- uh, first act the intro sequence the uh, ashitaga's travel uh, arriving at, at iron town we get uh, we the, the way uh, different elements are introduced is is really carefully planned out like uh, 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 ashitaga um, meets san he he meets the uh, the wounded uh, man from uh, from iron town the, the two wounded men um and and we meet the kodama and he travels through the forest and we get introduced to like the idea of 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 the uh, of the, the deer god of the forest um in the same way that we got introduced to the idea of lady iboshi in in her fight with the wolves um and uh, and his travel through the forest uh, like both characterizes him and his relationship to nature and it characterizes Iron Town's relationship to nature through uh, through the guy being like scared of the Kodama and like superstitious about the whole thing, uh, and it also establishes like a lot of geography, uh, like, like it establishes that you can get from this stream and to Iron Town uh, really quickly if you cut through the forest in this way. But it does take about a day, um, and then you get to Iron Town and you get to know them 
Armentown is the first side of the conflict that we get to actually like know and understand. And we see the complexities of the situation. Like we're, we're primed to like see Lady Boshi as the villain of the story. Like she's obviously the one that shot the ball that started the whole thing. But we get to like understand the people there, why they love her, why they respect her. And also like they, they, they don't like all entirely, uh, they aren't all, all entirely on the same side. Uh, we, we have this scene where Lady Bosch is like, you know, I, I, I really couldn't care less about, uh, about you, uh, wolf girl. But like these women, they want to fuck you up because like their, their husbands were killed by, by your family. So, so like there are different sides and complexities to it. And then it's only after uh, Ashitaka leaves that place after having learned all he, he like felt he needed to learn, he rescues San, and then we're introduced to the forest side and the complexities on that side with the apes having different opinions about what uh, is to be done uh, than the wolves do. Uh, and it's also where we get like uh, the the old boar god is, has arrived uh, for the for the uh, a conflict and everything is just like perfectly set up so we understand the uh, the, the size at that point. Uh, it's it, it's just like it, it's just so so well constructed and also like scene for scene, every single scene uh, either like uh, puts us in the shoes of some characters that we care about. Or immediately like uh, build intrigue by, by by showing something interesting happening and us wondering what's going on. It's just so tight. It's so good. Also, something that I noticed about this uh, about the scene, the scene composition, that wasn't that this kind of like um, maybe not unique to this movie, but kind of contrasted in other Miyazaki films. For instance, in the Totoro cast, we 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 explained how. In Totoro, there was like a very different kind of like idea of how film works and what is like conceptualized in Hollywood cinema a lot of the time, right? Yeah, it, when yeah, something is shown, shown in like a close up or like some, when something is given attention to, in is the classical cinema rule, it has to be relevant to the story and the plot, right? In Totoro, that wasn't the case. Like the, the environment can just breathe, like the dust bunnies, they can just be there. They don't have to have like this big narrative. Uh, impact on the plot however what also makes uh this film so good is that it does have that but it's so like well done and well constructed like there's not a single scene that doesn't have relevance to the organized like to the uh overall plot and narrative of the story even though it yeah. kind of seems so like for yeah. instance when the wolves attack that the two men fall down the mountains that uh that uh uh, uh, fuck, Ashitaka later saves. Um, there is like this this narrative. The boar came from the forest, which means that uh, in order for for Ashitaka to find a solution, he has to go to the origin of it, and then comes across these two men that were wounded in that earlier battle, and that kind of tied him to town. And then you have all these kinds of like little interactions where um, uh, the monk that got um, yeah, got Bo, asked yeah. by the emperor to uh, to take the head of the dear god um, was also introduced in this context where um, where he earlier got saved and then he had to like uh, kind of bail Ashtaka out when the the rice seller didn't want to sell him rice. It's like very like neatly like every scene has like narrative. Uh, significance that carries on later into the narrative. It's kind of like yeah. a constant like flow of like causes and effects that culminates in like a huge explosion. And, and what, one of the one of the really impressive uh, parts of this movie, and 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 you're you're totally right. This is like uh, all like uh, nuts and bolts, uh, you know, action film, action adventure filmmaking. Which uh, there's there's no uh, Hollywood uh, adage that you have to know the rules before you know how to break them. And, and like the, the way Miyazaki has broken the rules in the past, like we discussed uh, in the Totoro uh, episode, uh, just like here he really, really, really clearly shows how well he he, he can like follow uh, the rules. But at the yeah. same time, there are these sequences uh, within the film, especially specifically around the um, uh, uh, around the uh, uh, the clearing where the uh, where the forest guard dwells. That, that 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 retain that whole like letting the environment breathe uh type of thing however it's 
it's used for a thematic and story point. It's used to make us understand what's so holy, what's so important about this forest that must not be tainted. Like so, so, so he uses the same sort of mononoaware non-narrative uh, quietness, letting uh, the environment breathe, uh, but but uses it for like a story function. I th- I think it's phenomenal. Yeah, and 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 he even makes this explicitly a point in in turning point, and this is. The most important part, and I love that you brought up the Dust Sprites too, Ziff, because we have a counterpart to the Dust Sprites from Totoro in this movie, and it's the Kodama, the little forest oh, yeah. spirits that just are kind of there, and like funny little, guys who are Little Radley and modern yeah. art dudes. And Miyazaki yeah. has this to say about them. Essentially, they don't do anything in their presence, and it is just for them to be there as witnesses, isn't it? If nature is seen to be either useful or not useful, these Kodama spirits are not useful. And in a way, nature is full of things that are not useful to us. This is why I think the solution to environmental issues must be to shift our perspective from preserving nature because it is useful to preserving nature because it is not useful. So this is taking this idea of just letting nature breathe. It doesn't have to be useful. The dust sprites don't have to serve a distinct purpose for us. They just need to be there and we appreciate them. And putting it as Kodama in there to remind us of this idea that these presences are not useful to us, but are worth preserving anyways. Yeah, also on the on the topic of the, the structure and how tight this film is, uh, I couldn't help but notice uh, the similarities between this and Nausicaa, particularly because uh, you mentioned, you know, how um, in the bef- before the... Mononoke came out, um, Miyazaki had finished uh, all of the Norsica manga. And the Norsica movie, uh, even though it's quite good, I do think it's very clear that he had a lot of ideas that weren't fully developed or fully reached by the end. And uh, all things kind of feel a bit more simplified. While in the manga, he fully fleshed out this like big conflict and this big world and every uh, moving part of it. And so maybe with like that knowledge... He took that and like learned how to condense that into a film length finally, and that's why like all sides of this conflict feel realized and uh, everything feels like it works in this naturalistic way. And there's no kind of like artificial conclusion to this. Everything works in a, a real natural progression of narrative. But also like just to quickly touch upon like the similarity and difference to the Nausicaa movie specifically. It's interesting how in this movie in Mononoke. Uh, Kushana gets humanized in a sense, right? In, in Nausicaa, we understood like the huge like uh, attacking army as more of like just an aggressor and they, oh, we're trying to burn down the forest of Miasma of the toxic like poison forest. In this movie, we, we got to understand like there's a different reason for cutting down the forest and it is to grant space for certain humans to be able to live. Yeah, uh, Eboshi and Kushana are like incredibly similar characters. And since Kushana is so much more um, humanized and developed in the manga, it makes me think that Miyazaki Kono wanted to bring back that idea of this female leader character and these people who like deeply respect her. Because in in the uh, the Norsega manga, there's like a great moment where like all of Kushana's men like one by one sacrifice themselves for her because they like believe in her cause so much. And that's kind of something you could easily see happening with Lady Eboshi's people. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but before we move on completely from the film technical aspects that we uh, started discussing by talking about how amazingly directed and set up the narrative and structure is, uh, the score. Oh yes, I wanted to really, uh, because like this is a Joe Hisaishi uh, who uh, has written the score. I, th- I think every uh, Miyazaki film uh Maybe, maybe maybe aside from Nausicaa, I, I don't... No, no, he did, did, he did Nausicaa. He, yeah, he did, did Nausicaa, he... and not only did he do it, but also, like, it was, like, the very early Joe stuff, because he did a lot of, like, sci-fi OVAs as well, so he's, like, actually a composer very much used to synthesizers and stuff, and the early, like, Nausicaa soundtrack was actually, like, the first version was heavily synthesizer-based. As we discussed in the first Nausicaa, go reference it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Like uh, Studio Ghibli movies, we're often like uh, really f- focused on the visual part because like they're marvels of animation. But like the the scores that uh, uh, Joe uh, Hisaishi has made th- throughout uh, his career are just phenomenal. I, I think Mononoke is the, the best one yet. Uh, just when when the music, like the title card, when when the music, when uh, when Ashitaka travels and it's just these landscape shots. Uh, of him uh, uh, ri- riding th- uh, through like uh, Japan, riding westwards, and it's just the music, and you're just filled with this sense of grandness and adventure. It's 
it's so so uh so delicious it's it's such a great score yeah um it is but, but, incredible i love I the, the little best anecdote part of the score. oh yeah. you go, go ahead. ahead no go ahead go ahead okay okay one of the my favorite parts of how the score came to be and this is also a thing i discovered in turning oh sorry um let me repeat this. One of the best part, one of my favorite parts about the score is that I discovered how Miyazaki communicated with Johei Saishi to make him aware of how he actually wants this to sound and feel. And actually in Turning Point, there's multiple pages where there's just poems that Miyazaki has written to Im Im impress upon uh, 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 Johei Saishi what he wants. There's one called Princess Mononoke, one The Legend of Ashitaka, The People Who Are Lost, The Demon Spirit, uh, Wolf Goddess Moro, Lady Boshi, like tons of poems about like where he tried in words to capture the sense uh, of what he wants the music to feel like. And he says she received that. And it's really, really fucking showing that it worked because holy shit, the OST in this is... Mwah. Yeah, definitely. But but uh, I, I think actually the most impressive part uh, of the score is uh, is the silence. Now, now, now I, I know this is like straight up uh, ribbing off uh, Captain Christian's video on the, 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 the sound design of uh, Studio Ghibli movies, but... Um, but like the, the the use of silence is a part of scoring a movie. Like des deciding when to like keep it quiet, to keep keep the soundtrack quiet, is a very important thing. In the same way that choosing when not to cut is just as important as when uh, to do it. Um, and the the way it, the movie is constructed, there's all there's there's almost always th these sounds going on. Either the the score is, uh, during like otherwise quiet sequences when we're in iron town there's all the uh the the, the hammering uh the work going on in the background which gets gets us like into the to the space uh in the forest there's all obviously all these uh, uh, uh the noises of nature you know but the forest guard the night walker is completely uh like like uh c completely connected with silence it does not make a sound like throughout the whole movie. I think aside from when it's transforming at the very end when it gets shot, it, it it's completely quiet. It doesn't. Its footsteps don't make a sound. It there's no noise when we when we see it appear before us. It feels much more holy in that way. Like 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 you're in the in a, in a quiet cathedral uh, of sorts. Uh, like you see this big lumbering figure there during its Nightwalker, the Nightwalker se sequence, which is just like so awesome in like in in the original meaning of the word, and and it's like huge and it's walking and you can see exactly when it takes a step, and there's no sound, there's no boom, it just it's, it's just like there, like the air. It's amazing. Yeah, damn. Yeah, it is sublime, which is what we mean by awesome right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> really yeah, really yeah, but, sublime yeah that, that, that's what the philosophy nerds uh, mean when they say awesome i guess oh yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> but it's it's actually a fitting word in my opinion yeah um but uh and like and and, and another part of the the the, uh, the the soundtrack of the movie that uh, i really enjoyed was was like the the voice acting like the gravitas especially the, when it's brought to like the uh, the the animal characters the uh, the, the animal gods uh, their, their speaking voices, the way it's it's mixed and, uh, and combined with the voice acting, just you really feel like these are like larger than life characters who have like lived through ancient times. Uh, it, it is, it is especially like the um, the wolf uh, mother. I think uh, her name was a Moro. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, Akihiro uh, Miwa, who is the voice actor for Moro, who's actually um, like a well-known drag queen in kind of like. Uh, I guess Japanese pop culture, and was hired to do the voice of the Wolf Mother, which I think is a, a pretty interesting pick for the Wolf Mother being like a, a definitively female character, but getting someone who kind of uh, plays around with gender in real life and has kind of a more clearly more masculine voice to voice them, which gives them kind of a gives Moro kind of an unworldly quality, but also um, this kind of separate nature idea of what gender could be, like that the wolf could have a masculine voice, but is still very clearly a mother. So uh, it kind I, of reflects I, I, a bit I, on how I, the characters. I think I remember. I think I remember reading that it also had to do with like uh, the Japanese, like cultural ideas of of like the wolf and the wolf spirits being like specifically, uh, like in in a way specifically ma like uh, spiritually masculine in a way. Um, so, 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 like, it also ties into uh, into the mythology that's being drawn from. 
I, like, I, I, I might be wrong about that. It's uh, uh, me myself. I didn't really have the the idea that the Moto Cross is like is very like masculine in some way. Uh, I guess like. I mean, her voice was like very authoritative. I guess, like, I don't know. I I, had, I have kind of hard to kind of find a way in which, like the, like her voice being, in this way, being very relevant. I don't know. I mean, it is. It must be relevant to take like an icon of the Japanese dragon LGBT scene to voice this character to some extent. I mean, I wouldn't say that's something that happens by accident. Akihiro Miwa is also not 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 frequently an anime voice actor. So, no. I mean, I, I looked at the history of uh, Akihiro Miwa's uh, voice acting history in anime, and it's actually uh, Mononoke Hime is the first one, I think, uh, that, that she uh, he did. I mean, it's really interesting. Um, I, I do feel it's really interesting. I guess I'm just kind of, like, struggling in how it's relevant exactly, because in this film, largely doesn't... Like, it's a very feminist film, don't get me wrong, but largely it doesn't really deal with very many lgbt related issues and um yeah i guess like the the voice acting like the hiring this voice actor specifically is like very like is relevant because you wouldn't just randomly do that because even though he isn't like traditional voice actor you just hire this famous drag queen apparently i don't i didn't like personally feel at least that like the voice was like especially like masculine or uh brought some kind of like very internally like essentially masculine aspects or i guess um flavors to the character i guess it it felt like a very matriarchal character yeah, at any rate, it's a pretty noticeable shift uh, if you're familiar with the English uh, dub, where it's a distinctly female uh, voice actress uh, giving, like, still like a a big, like, godly, authoritative uh, voice, but like distinctly female as well. So, it's probably, yeah, it's probably also uh, it's probably also relevant to point out that gender swapping in anime as uh, is actually very common. Um, and it's it's also very common in the Jap- in the history of Japanese art, where in theater uh, men used to play women a lot, and uh, also in the modern anime scene, there's a lot of like uh, women that uh, voice young men, for instance. Oh yeah, obviously. And the like, other way around, yeah. like um, I guess uh, I don't know. I, I basically what I'm trying to say is maybe it's not good to like kind of jump to any conclusions about like what this voice acting might say about the actual narrative and themes of the film i don't know um no i disagree i think there's a lot of parallels we can uh, i think there's a lot of parallels you can connect with the uh, the other like major female characters in it in san and uh, lady eboshi in the way they both kind of transgress traditional female roles particularly for like historical stories yeah yeah, there's, there's another part of uh, of, of San that, that I might as well mention here that I really, re- like, the, I think one of the reasons why she, she's such a beloved and iconic character is, like, she she takes that um, concept of, you know, the the girl raised by, uh, ra- raised, raised by, like, wild beasts slash, like, uh, nature gods and stuff, um, but it, like, doesn't go a sexual route with it. Like, that's, it's such a annoying cliche having uh, have, having you know characters uh especially female characters grow up uh like uh, outside of civilization and using that as a like way of them being so so naive about sexuality that they hang their tits out all the time or or like the um uh, the, the, the main guy gets to like be so impressive because they know anything about sexuality uh and stuff like that and being like the first to seduce them ish and kind of the reverse happens with Tarzan in a way, like like just gender swapped, but 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 like it, she she's like just she's a person, like like she she's not sexualized in a in any like uh, overt way. Although she, like to, like she she's like she's beautiful still. Oh yeah, that trope is so annoying. <laughs> yeah, I think there's yeah. actually a moment that like specifically exists to like uh, go against that, in which like the first moment they like quote unquote kiss, it's so she can like chew <laughs> up food moment, and I feed think. it into his mouth, which is uh, distinctly 
And I mean, and some people that's probably a turn on, but you know, like for the most of us, that's. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's actually like a really interesting little detail that 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 you choose like your like r- romantic pair to have like one uh, like ki- quote unquote kissing scene, and it's like a very like practical bit of intimacy in a way. But I mean, we can talk about the 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 absence of sexuality in San's character in a sense, but also like well, we were just on the topic a little bit of of Moro's uh, uh, gender. Let's talk about San's gender because. If anything, I'm not. Sh- uh, there's not much of traditional or uh, understandings of femininity present in San, unless like we take some primordial ferality of it, like this, this like because San. Oh yeah, is that, that, really that's the flip side. Feral, that's the flip right? side of the yeah. whole like being naive about sex. The the, the other like uh, annoying trope you can go with is go go the completely other direction where because they're so wild, they're so uh, dominant and that's sexy in a way. Like that's I, I mean. It's better than calling naivete and innocent sexy, but like still, like, c- yeah. come on. Sun is wild. She is yeah. primordial. She's feral. She has, she's not like for, for, you know, she, she hangs out with the wolves and she, she, yeah. she loves her wolf siblings. And it's like, that's what's going on there. And that's interesting because it kind of makes us, uh, Ashitaka clearly sees her as a girl and as a human, but it's very clear to us that this is by far not what Sun sees herself as. Yeah, I think it, like I think even in the first shot where we see her, uh, not the first shot where we see her face properly because she's she's earlier in the movie fighting a Boshi, but when uh, uh, Ashitaka first sees her, she's like, uh, like bite, like sucking the the bullet out of her mother's big wound, and then she's her face is just comes away covered in blood, and it's like this really primordial, yeah, kind of image of like the fierce female warrior with blood smeared on her. Absolutely, I believe iconic. if the Thunderer was here with us today, he would. Uh, be uh, referencing menstruation and that somehow. <laughs> okay, okay, listen, listen, okay. you say that, but Susan Napier actually did it in, in, in from Akira yeah, to House Movie Castle. Yeah, well. yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, just, just a side question here, so, uh, if I may. Um, g- g- given what you said about like San identifying as, as a wolf, does San think Ashitaka is a furry? <laughs> Uh, yeah. he, 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 she refers to him as a disgusting human. Yes! <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I would think connection. so. <laughs> well, Sun really doesn't like the furry community, huh? <laughs> no, no, the opposite. Like, he isn't furry enough for her. Oh, yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. She's the true wolf girl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, oh, little okay. si- little side note: Is it am I the only one who like that scene where we first see the blood on her face? Is it me or does that look really weird? Because like I, the I think that might be like, like some computer the, effects. Over yeah, there. the blood like looks realistic, but the rest of the blood in the movie is like big goopy anime blood, so it just yeah. looks like kind of a bizarre contrast. Like someone drew that on after the fact. I don't know. I didn't notice that much. But also, funny thing to notice about San. Um, uh, first, I kind of want to go back because I noticed something funny when. You were talking about these like harmful tropes about wild women and stuff. It was like kind of like a uh, weird whiplash for me because like in my mind, like Miyazaki and Miyazaki films, films associated with Ghibli are just so aware of like uh, harmful gender norms that it didn't even occur to me that that was a path that Miyazaki could take with this yeah, character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like, I can't even imagine what that would look like or like, if if this film would like uh take a whole different segment and just like try to flesh out Sans and, and Ashitaka's relationship, that would be so weird and jarring and I couldn't even imagine it. Yeah, it's like, like I, I, I don't as much point it out to in you know, order to, to say like, oh, they're so good for avoiding this because like yeah. we should expect that, obviously, that that they'd avoid those kinds of dumb shit, especially because it's a very Western trope in a way. Um uh, with with like roots like d- deep roots in uh in the fetishization and ob- objective uh, like uh objectification of indigenous women but uh but at any rate like the, the the main reason i pointed out is because like um san is such a like again beloved and iconic character and and i think she's um and and, and her being like this wild girl raised by wolves is part of that um and and the the reason why like like she's so awesome why while others like like other characters and other uh pieces of media who do the same concept like don't work i i, I think has a lot to do with with that like like the yeah. uh unsexualization in a way. 
I think it's also good that you pointed it out because it's good to like kind of appreciate that how far this movie has kind of transgressed those kinds of like harmful expectations and the harmful depictions of gender roles that are so common. Yeah. Um, so I think it was good to point it out, even though I hadn't thought of it, like probably even because I hadn't thought of it myself before. And also, while we are on the topic of San, it, it's, I think it's super interesting because she is kind of like on the periphery, right? She's like, we, we talked about the themes before where there's like, it's depicting like a, t- a time, then like a limited time, a time that's in, in, the, in, in like transition towards something else. Like this kind of transitionary kind of like idea is also encapsulated in, in, in Sam's character. Because on the one hand, she is a human herself. Um, and there is no, uh, like, it's not like there's like some miracle weird that she's actually like biological connected to any of the wolves. She just kind of got adopted, right? Yeah, um, like it, 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 she, she was, uh, her, her parents like gave her to, uh, to, to the wolves while fleeing. Like they, they, they gave up their baby and the wolves were like, whoa, we were going to e- e- eat those folks. But that, that was just a dick move. We're going to raise this girl as our own. <laughs> yeah. so, so on the one hand, she is like human, like biologically, but like she kind of completely socialized, like uh, connected to the world of these spirits and gods and like animals. So it's kind of like she's in this weird in-between space where she's hard kind of to define and she's not really um she's kind of also struggling with that herself it's like oh i hate all humans because they're trying to report destroy the fort but i'm also kind of a human herself yeah. and i think she kind of tries to dig that in uh kind of like tries to bury that in her like <laughs> try to not think of herself as a human <laughs> Yeah, like uh, 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 Ashitaka and San, the, the relationship is all about like like uh, uh, Ashitaka hel- helping her like f- find yeah. like the, the good in her own humanity in a way. Yeah, uh, and it's it's a really like uh, important uh, thematic part of the movie. Also, their connection as they're they're both like uh, characters in this liminal space between uh, bet- between uh, an ancient civilization. In a, in a way, Ashitaka kind of gets adopted by uh, by Iron Town, like having lost his village. In the same way that uh, uh, San gets adopted by the wolves, having lost her parents. But I also would like to point out, while we're on it, that everyone, every character in this movie is kind of in between. In between, and while San is uh, on the side of nature, trying to repress the, her humanity, I think uh, looking at her counterpart, Lady Boshi, she is on the side of technology and civilization and humanity, but is su- suppressing like the idea that she's also part of nature and depending on subsisting from and on nature. And I think that's that's kind of crucial yeah. to understanding yeah, like how I these think positions. A, I think an important cement. part there is literally how Lady Eboshi characterizes San from like her perspective, and because it's it's is in the name of the movie itself, uh, Princess Mononoke, because Mononoke vaguely kind of translates to like possessed by spirit or like of the spirit or whatever. And Lady Eboshi keeps saying that, like, that girl is under a wolf's curse. But, like, we learn later that that's not true. She's under no curse. She's not been brainwashed. She was just raised by the wolves and sees them as, like, like deserving of agency and, like, they're her family. So Lady Eboshi can only, like, understand it if a human would go against them like this and be for the wolves if they were somehow, like, cursed or tainted in a way. But as we understand, and I would say, like you said, curse, she's not cursed. I think everyone is cursed. And, you know, my boy Jikubo agrees with me. And this is like the whole point, right? Everyone is kind of cursed. But what is a curse? What does the curse mean? That's what I want to talk about next. Because the curse is the inciting moment and everyone is plagued by curse. And as Jikubo points out, the world is cursed and everyone is going to die. <laughs> what a humor what a doomer uh yeah. yeah curse like the curse starts us off on this entire ride so it must be like thematically of like prime significance for us to understand what this curse does what it means where where does it come from where does it go you know all these where did it come from yeah. Nigel? exactly it came from cot Nigel. that that fucker <laughs> that cursing fucker <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it hadn't been uh, for God Nigel, Ashitaka would have been married a long time ago. Yeah, oh, no. which is actually true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. kind of. Um, like, like I, 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 I saw somewhere like I, I, I couldn't find a proper source for it, 
but like the um the the quote unquote sister character that Ashitaka says goodbye to who, who gives that a uh, crystal dagger or what or is it an arrowhead or something um it's a dagger to to yeah uh, like Ashitaka breaking the, the the fucking rules of the village like for minute one nice nice job there you weren't supposed to talk to anyone um but I but mean, anyway he's Spanish anyway so yeah he gives shit about their rules. Yeah, at, at, at any rate, um, like um, there, there's there's some translation stuff going on there where where like she calls him older brother, but it it might actually be like a, a, a sort of like old honorary way of referring to someone you respect, and they they were actually like uh, supposed to be like lovers, or uh, she was supposed to be uh, his fiance or something, and that uh, that arrowhead was then like a, a sort of like symbol of the of their uh marriage which like adds a lot more significance to like uh Ashitaka sending it to uh, to San later in the story so 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 it might might be true but again like I couldn't find a like a proper source for, for it I mean, yeah. you said in one interview that they are not actually blood related because that would kind of be boring. That's what Miyazaki actually said. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> He's not into Fucking, that. He's not he literally into said that. Yeah, Manga like, Sensei got, got called out like, <laughs> de- like, like, like two like, decades like before the, it was made. The interview asked him, um, so they're not real brother and sister, and he and he was like, if they were, that wouldn't be interesting at all. So yeah. Miyazaki calls that. incest porn boring. <laughs> you heard it here first. Truly really a man ahead of his time. <laughs> <laughs> he predicted this. Oh, damn, he foresaw this. But yeah, uh, while well, as we've talked about now, the village, of course, like what banishes Ashitaka from the village. It's really interesting to me to understand that Ashitaka, at the start of the film, was protecting his village from an enraged, from a like cursed boar, from Nago, which we learn is his name, uh, who's cursed, who's like exploding in these uh, little worms protruding from his skin. Miyazaki, by the way, saying about this animation that this is how he feels like when he's angry at someone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, I mean, I, yeah. You do not want face. to face the wrath of, uh, of of an old expert craftsman of any sort. Uh, oh, I mean, you don't want to. It's, it's going to be terrible. But yeah, there's this absolutely enraged and furious boar runs and, ch- and, and threatens the village. And obviously you can see there's some reservations in Ashitaka that he's like, oh, boar, please, please go back to the forest, go back to the forest. Uh, I don't want to kill you. And then he has to because the boar is literally threatening his village. However, still, even though Ashitaka is acting in a sort of defense, he catches this curse, which made the boar cursed somehow. And this curse is then enough reason for his village to uh, exile him. So this is really interesting to think about, okay, what is this curse even that that not only makes the boar so absolutely furious but also then leads to ashitaka's expulsion from the community like how can we understand this yeah it also sort of implies that he was wrong to do it yeah. like like, like he, he sh- this what should, should they have done like should they have incapacitated the boar how <laughs> it's uh yeah and then they they, they, they even like uh the, the the uh the village elder she she uh, makes a short prayer to like please bear us no ill will we hope you rest in peace and the boss like fuck that shit i hope you all fucking die in a pile of your own shit yeah. <laughs> and then, like, it dissolves into uh the fucking most creepy fucking ball skeleton of all time yeah so yeah <laughs> he dissolves in pure hatred yeah. he probably yeah, made, made the ass stinky for like a couple of decades <laughs> so that, like, yeah it's disgusting scene as well because like we've thought it was before, a great scene like yeah i mean it, it was really good because like uh, before we saw about like that the violence was like kind of like uh dinky and not with like a lot of gore in it sometimes but this was like really fucking gory and like disgusting and shit or at least they tried their best to make like this uh or like disintegrating yeah like come off like really like disgusting and gory yeah, I, th- I think there was another example of a CG that that they used to to like to transition between like st- still still frames of uh, of of the ball in various stages of uh, decomposition. Um, yeah. in, in the same way, actually, that later uh, I think they, they use CG to uh, for, for 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 when the um, when the forest around Iron Town gets uh, like regrows after the, the uh, quote unquote death of the forest god. Like the, the, it's it's the same sort of effect where where like one image morphs into another, and 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 again it's a way that CG is is used and associated with uh, the, the these magical effects. So 
but but now back to the topic of curse. I right. really want to do yeah. some yeah, little yeah. bit of close reading with y'all on on the topic of curse. So we have I, I've taken like a couple of notes of multiple scenes where curse is is happening and is acting up. So we just talked about the scene where Ashitaka got the curse from the boar who was also cursed and getting furious and angry. Then we have Ashitaka's arm, which is now cursed, giving him strength. Then we have his arm trembling and pulsating and enacting acts of violence because it is now super strong and he can like use his bow and arrow to shoot people's heads off with a bow and arrow. And then we have a very, a very significant scene and I just want to list them all so we can then talk about broadly what the curse is. Then we have the scene where he sees the forest god for the first time and suddenly his arm starts hurting and hurting and he needs to stick it in the water to... to, to spasms. Yeah, absolutely. Then he has the scene where he uh, sees that Lady Boshi is uh, making the lepers build weapons and his arm is spasming again. He cannot, basically cannot contain can himself. When he learns that uh, Lady Boshi has m- built the weapons and has built the ammunition and has made lepers build I, these I, weapons I think it's just killing. as that, like, she, she specifically takes responsibility, like, like, like she, she takes responsibility for shooting uh, the ball that originally cursed him. So, so it's basically yeah, yeah. the boss anger being like, kill that bitch right now. And yeah. he's like, nah, that wouldn't solve anything. Stop. Also, um, I really like the detail that the iron specifically is what uh, po- they say poisons and like turns the boar to hatred. Because it wasn't that they just killed the boar, but they shot him with this huge lump of iron that like fucked up his organs and caused him to like stew in this hatred because the iron itself was the thing like stolen from his land and like for the purpose of Lady Aboshi's yeah. profit. So it's kind of like this ex- this perfect symbol of like it- w- everything he hates about them. Yeah. It feeds wonderfully into the cause of the curse, uh, which I wanted to get to when I introduced all the examples. But yeah, I guess you're right. You're completely right. Like the iron that punctured the uh, uh, boar caused him hatred, caused him hatred against humans, caused him to lash out and in furious rage, like just run against humans. And the humans that he ultimately ended up harming weren't the humans that caused it. So Ashitaka's tribe, the Emishi, had no fault in this situation with the boar. However, the rage of the boar was still directed at them. The hatred, the blindness, basically. The anger of the boar cursing these humans as he was dying. And it's really interesting how this then turns into Ashitaka's curse. And he is expelled from his community at no fault of his own. Like, the curse seems to be people inflicting violence on other people, causing a cycle of hatred, whereas these people that are being punished for it usually have no fault. Like, the boar was not at fault for being shot. The uh, uh, Ashitaka was not at fault for, like, the, the boar. Like, he, of course, had to protect the village. Like, and, and this goes round and round. And I feel like even we cannot even blame Lady Iboshi for shooting the boar, really, because what she was doing was protecting her people and expand, expanding her land in ways that she had yeah. to do until the yeah, nature fought back. I mean, there was literal war. Like, the boars attacked, and she had to, she had to, she had to fight them off in order to protect her own people. This cycle of hatred and this curse, and we can just equate it now. I think the curse is hatred, is anger, is having your eyes clouded by hatred is and resentment, is a, a cycle where you cannot really find someone to blame, but still like a continual perpetuation of the cycle of violence, which is then why I find it so interesting how Ashitaka takes control of the curse and the strength to like break up the fight between Lady Boshi and Sun. Like when they're fighting, yeah, that's such a he's, badass moment. He, like, he's full of curse, like his curse, and like uh, San is biting his arm, and the curse seeps out. And you get the sense that he is, I mean, not only like figuratively, but also literally carrying their weight. He is taking on their anger. Like, like he, the curse seeps deeper into him. Like his entire chest area is covered later on when he encounters more and more scenes that instill hatred in him. But he's still like. Uh, set on taking it all in and like he literally carries San's weight and he's literally carrying Lady Iboshi's weight until he hands her over to her community and and that's like such a remarkable kind of like uh, depiction of of the the uh, hatred seeping through him which he must curb at any moment and keep under control uh, lest it become like the th- like, lest he perpetuate the cycle of violence yeah um it's a uh... It, 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 it's it's interesting the way um I, I think um movies with Mike he has has a video on Nausicaa where where he points out like that it's 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 such a specific way of depicting evil that that uh in this movie uh it's not evil pe- people doing evil things because they're evil it's uh it's like that uh that iron bullet it's 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 something others others put something in you 
that like grows and festers and uh, and, and and turns into hatred. Um, and, and like the uh, the the wise uh, elder woman of the of the village like tells Ajitaka that the 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 cure for it isn't to like avenge the the boar to go, uh, and and he recognizes this later when he get, has the chance to like kill uh, or attempt to kill Lady Eboshi where she stands. It's like that wouldn't solve anything. Like the um, the solution involves uh, seeing with. Uh, eyes unclouded by hatred which is such an, such an important line to, to the whole yeah, movie absolutely. and that, that's the reason we've been referencing it throughout this episode um but but, but like the, basically it is in the same way that like the the uh solution to the cycle of violence and hatred is letting go but but not only like letting go yourself but like helping others to let go in some way and 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 helping others m- uh, mend the wounds that, that have been made I would say, uh, which is so bit, much more difficult. I would say even a step further. It is not necessarily to let go, and not necessarily to like help others to let go. It is also to accept that there are some co- inherent conflicts. There are some irreconcilable antagonisms there. This world and this people are cursed, but we still wish to live. Is like one line that is really important in this film. Like you can't stand in the middle, but there are decisive moments when you have to take sides. For an instance, and and and. and move on because there is no right and no wrong however like and this is Miyazaki talked about this and this was one of the main things that he wanted to achieve with the movie he wanted to have a movie where they where the ending could be I love you Ashitaka but I can't forgive human beings and he will smile and say that's all right won't you live together with me that's his vision that we cannot forgive but we can still live and that's we can't we can't forgive but we can kind of like forget it (laughs) well we Oh, we no, can, we can live despite this cursed and cruel world. That's that the, yeah. We're, we're gonna get more into this. How we get to having to live through all the other thematic elements that we're gonna discuss as we move along through this really complex movie. But now I really just want to stick again to the curses, um, because once two things we haven't cleared yet is kind of how the curse relates to the deer god. So we talked yeah, about the yeah, scene yeah. where Ashitaka sees the deer god for the first time, and then the, his curse starts throbbing. And in, in my view, it was it is kind of unclear what exactly it is. It could be that he like sees the deer god and understands in this moment like his magnificence, like kind of what is lost when nature is being destroyed, or that the deer god can like share his own pain like either or like because in this scene it feels like there's some connection going on yeah i also think that's because of the the uh the pain what you said like like he has the curse of the forest the the, the good what everything what 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 got destroyed by the by the humans and he shares this pain with ashitaka so that he realizes how bad humans could or what humans did to his forest that's uh, that's at least my my opinion about this. I I I don't think the um the forest god has that kind of like specific like personality slash a- a- agency. It's it, it's a force more than it's a character in the movie. Um, I I think another reading might be that this ball was so filled with hatred that in a way it also like blamed the forest god for not not helping it. In the same way that the balls that arrive so, uh, later are like. Uh, super pissed at the uh, at the forest god for not for for, for reviving Ashitaga, but not uh, re- re- reviving their their friend. Uh, what, what was his name? No- Nogo. Nago. 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 Yeah, yeah, not reviving Nago. Like the, the the forest god doesn't care about us. Yeah, it why does that- the forest god not care? Why does the forest god not revive Nago? Why does the forest god not heal the curse? That's that's yeah, a really yeah. important question to answer. Here. Yeah, exactly. So, so it might be that rage that flares up when uh, when he spots yeah. the forest god. I think it's just because, like the, as you said, the force god is not like a character. It's just kind of like a metaphysical force that kind of represents nature, right? It's not like, um, it it just takes life and like kind of gives life as it, like uh, as it's time for the the life to be over or when it's time for a life to be born. It doesn't really have any like moral intention or consideration in mind. However, there are moments like, when it decides to take life, and there are moments when it decides to heal. Yeah, but like th- those moments are kind of like seen at least as like kind of like inaccessible from our, from our point of view. I I don't know. Is there really like a motivation behind it? Yeah, yes, I, I, I agree with so. that. I, I think I think it's going for it's balance. It's very ambiguous anyway. on purpose whether yeah. things yeah. like are brought back to life or not. Because like again, like we even see, the forest god decides to uh 
cleanse him of the bullet wound but not the curse so it chooses to like give some things or like but leave others and i think it's mostly just trying to represent this um this idea that like so, some things will just like continue to happen like cruelty and disease and natural disasters kind of are going to exist and you kind of have to live through them like Nyan was saying like uh, a critical moment for Lady Eboshi's character is she says she wants to kill the deer god and she's made some kind of arrangement with the uh, people to give the head to the emperor but she also says to herself it might even cure disease like the lepers so she's maybe thinking oh maybe I could just kill this god and cure my lepers and then you know this disease that's affected them horribly will just be fine like if I just you know kill enough things then maybe it'll work out for me but it's it, mm. the movie doesn't allow for such like simple answers where it's like no this disease of for the lepers is just going to continue natural disasters and death will just happen it's a a part of the cycle that you cannot fight it, it is, is the a, fear of death that leads humans to infringe on nature in many ways in some ways yeah. obviously you need to secure ways to live right not get mauled by wolves that's why we build houses not to be struck by lightning that's why we put a roof above our heads not to like die from earthquakes that's why we build like earthquake shelters or whatever <laughs> you know uh, the whole idea is like somehow the being afraid of death is how we carve things out of nature and the same thing is true for the emperor who says I want immortality bring me the head of the god like that's the symbolic uh, uh, representation that we have there that humanity carves itself out of nature its own place where it can face death or avoid death let's say and that's that's what we what we are facing here however it is an illusion and this is this is a really good point that you brought up so like it is an illusion that god does not heal it also destroys it is inherently part of it that this is how it works it will not fix your issues even if you go and destroy it and kill the head and whatever uh, the idea of completely being able to conquer nature is just human hubris and this is made clear in this film too like it's not that we that that progress will eventually solve all issues nature is inherently violent and does not solve all issues it's it, it's even like a, a part of the design of, of the dear god the, the the way like when it takes a step and, and and a small little garden grows around its its hoof and then wilters immediately it what, what a beautiful imagery but also like uh, like really like kind of disturbing in a way like, like also the way it's it's like it breathes on this um on, on this like little branch that uh, that sun presents for it uh, and the branch wilters but it heals uh Ishitaka. it's pretty interesting uh the duality of uh, d life and death obviously yeah. The cycle also, it seems that there's something being taken from somewhere else to put somewhere else. It's like the, this balance of like when something is created, something must be destroyed. Yeah. Um. I. Th uh, yeah. It's a true alchemist. Um. Yeah. There's, um, yeah. There, there's, there's an, another thing I wanted to point out is like I. Th I think part of like if there's any motivation uh to to uh who gets la like a favor from the uh, or like the original D, um. The deer, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it, it's it's like it, it kind of it rewards like this uh, it, tranquility and balance in a way. It, it does not reward hatred. Um, so uh, so it, it it grants the the, the old blind uh, uh, boar god. It, it grants it like peace from uh, from from those uh, hate worms almost consuming it. Yeah, and uh, and it it, it grants uh, a a shitaga uh, like like. Um, it heals the wound he got from de-escalating uh, the the situation for for re rescuing San and for and and for 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 his attempts. But it but it can't like lift the curse because like the curse has a deeper cause than like what Ashitaka has has done. Like it it, it goes back to the whole like conflict and it only disappears once there's this calm over everything at, at the very end when. Um, when when all si when when all has been lost and, and regained and people are ready to like move to a to a new better status quo that's what lifts the curse and like he he which is like really interesting because like he doesn't really have much control over that like obviously like much of it is thanks to his efforts but like holy crap what what a thing to ask of someone just because they like protected their village from something they couldn't like control happening well, yeah, the, the dear god is very neutral to this entire um, cause and effect thing. For him, it probably doesn't matter. Yeah, he has like a, a bigger like thing in mind. Like we don't clearly know what it is, 
but it's very clear that the deer god doesn't operate on the same sort of like moral and ethical principles that a lot of the other characters do. it's like which by um, the way is all of them have different ethics and moral systems yeah. i'm probably going to get into this as well because it's so complex what everyone is in here for I wanted to get into like, as we now talked about like kind of Ashitaka's approach to nature, we talked about the deer god a lot. I want to like kind of zoom in on the Iron Town now some more because this is like where we get into some real interesting stuff because as alluded to, obviously, like we talked about the idea that humans kind of carve their place in the world out of nature to settle down and that they can go too far in their own hubris. But I want to really stress how much it is clear to us that Iron Town is a kind of utopian community for the time period and for the people living there. This is a place Smart, where yeah. Lady Iboshi has managed to take outsiders and rejects of society who would otherwise be prostitutes and lepers begging in the street and like poor people and like peasants and gave them a life that they seem to enjoy, a sense of community, work that pays well, that feeds them well, and like a space where they can protect themselves and each other from this violent and cruel world outside. And really, like the huge walls of the Iron Town to me, like scream safety and like community. Everyone in there knows each other, they joke with each other, they get along. Like, I this is a, like a really tiny detail, but I found it really remarkable that the angry guard guy who's like really skeptical of Ashitaka coming in, like, oh, the stranger and mm, you better not fuck around here. And like the women are reprimanding him and he's just taking it. He's like, oh. <laughs> and he's like getting all weak in face of like the, the very assertive, strong-willed women who are like defending Ashitaka. And like it is this uh, respite, uh, this respite, this safe space for this community that could not exist anywhere else in this world that yeah. is crafted out of the mountain by Lady Iboshi who's gathering people around her that she genuinely cares for. And this is really interesting to me that we have this space be in the position of what in way simpler movies would be antagonists. They are obviously coded as like what we would understand in a simpler movie to be the bad guys, the antagonists, because, oh, they destroy nature. But they are not in this movie. The movie has such a understanding of them, what they are doing and their justification and how they approach the world that we understand that to some extent it is necessary for their survival and to some extent like they are just fighting for their own place in the world. So this is this is yeah. what I find so remarkable here. They are not bad guys, even though we could it's, it's, slip into thinking about them like this. Yeah. It's even part of the construction of the movie. Like like the Iron Town is also a respite from for the viewer because uh, as mentioned before, this is a very serious movie. I think Iron Town and to, to some some degree also a uh, uh, Jigobo are, are like the only bits of levity we get uh, are like the the villagers and uh, the, the townspeople of iron town uh the, the uh that, that that lady who who like is is so fucking down on her husband that she criticizes him for get, getting home alive and worrying her like the, that, that kind of like joking around and, and, and like not worrying that much is like yeah it's it's obviously obviously a luxury that the uh the the animals don't get because they're fighting for their goddamn lives uh, all the time, but it, it 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 still like adds this sense of like where where the forest is meant to, to like feel obviously like holy and and grand and worth like preserving. Uh, Iron Town is meant to feel like like a home, you know, where 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 you where where you, where you meet people who uh who are good people and uh and do their best and joke around and. Also funny because I feel that like in a way, um, Iron Town is like kind of like real main character of the film, and it sounds kind of weird to say because on its own, being a main character doesn't really mean anything outside of context. But I still kind of want to highlight this because if you look at this film, uh, what you're gonna see is that the only real like entity in in the film that kind of has a future or like kind of has has something going forward or looking forward to is iron town right is the people of iron town like um ashitaka basically all the all like the the fates and like the causes and effects of every single uh like like party in this film kind of gets gets siphoned into iron town like uh, the the forests they they die and they get born again kind of at the end um Ashitaka is from a tribe that's gonna probably die out soon, very sadly. Um, the the Mikado uh, Empire is also on its last legs. Basically, uh, Iron Town is the only real sort of like uh, 
entity in the film with like a real kind of vision for progress and kind of like a, an actual future. And that's what I think is very interesting. You touched on something incredibly powerful here, which ties into like how I understand like how Miyazaki approaches history and, and, and liminal spaces of time in this movie and also how he applies it to modernity. So one huge thing that he talked about um, when he was thinking about how to make this movie was the idea that there that there once was was a feeling that when you go in the forest, there will be a huge spirit, a creature, a monster. It will somehow be alive. It will somehow be wild. And he says sometimes in the, at some point in the Muromachi period, this sense has gotten lost and was replaced by viewing nature as useful, as something to be transformed, as something to be cultivated and put rice paddies there and turn into uh, habitable spaces for, for mankind, which is, by the way, a scene that is very interesting also in Only Yesterday by Takahara, where, where we talked about how nature seems natural, but is actually constructed. It was made by humans from top down uh, from everywhere like the modern nature that we see outside the fields the the, the rice fields the the little rivers and ev everything is almost certainly to a huge extent shaped by humans these wild deep forests where there's there, there, where spirits dwell don't exist anymore yeah and then the movie makes that clear from the opening image where where, where we we get this uh, this text explaining that like once upon a time you know these Yeah. Uh, th these mountains were filled with the most ancient forests where the spirits dwelled. And Miyazaki is really medita meditating on this kind of transformation that is happening here. Like the spirits dwelled there, but the god, the, the, the dear god, in a sense disappeared, but still exists. In which shape does he exist? Well, kind of in, in our spirits. Like this is kind of like huge, a huge deal of Miyazaki. He's stressed again and again that he thinks that despite these forests and these deep spirits hidden beasts and hidden in the forest are lost, he thinks they exist somehow in the like the soul of the Japanese like cultural imagination still. Which is um, what is also like I think what Ashitaka means by the end that the dear god is, is all around us still despite him having like uh, fallen and like disappeared into the nature that is now uh, more or less for human cultivation and this I think reflects like the sense of transformation and change because ultimately no matter what progress will Uh, exist and continue to exist will win out against nature will win out against everything in a sense that not that everything afterwards is better and like more blessed and everything is, is good but there will be a sense of loss every transformation brings with it the sense of loss and we return to Mono no Avara by the way as, as we always do but this transformation where the deer god and the deep forest and all the gods are dead like all these huge spirit creatures all most of them are dead they 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 will fade away. Their time is kind of over in favor of progress. And progress is that humans are adaptable and can live despite like all of this. And this is not to not Miyazaki saying, oh, let's, let's all support progress. This is Miyazaki like kind of mourning the spiritual loss that goes hand in hand with this approach to the world, despite it being somehow necessary and, you know, important. And one way in which I think this is uh, symbolized perfectly in the film is through the muskets. Which is that, I mean, the muskets shooting the iron bullets is the first thing, the inciting moment, which causes the curse. And also the muskets remain the one thing that helps human progress and embodies progress. Because, of course, the muskets, very current development, a gun, an effective means of warfare, is not only the means by which this community can fend off the, sh the, the, the emperor and the samurai, but also how this community wins out against nat nature, ultimately, in some sense. And um, this is also, I mentioned earlier, Seven Samurai, of course. This is a very similar theme as in Seven Samurai. If you notice when you watch that film, the gun denies the samurai heroic death because whenever they die, they are shot. O oftentimes off screen or just on the sidelines, like never really noticeable. Somehow the heroism and the nobility of samurai is made obsolete by the gun, by the simple fact and existence of the gun. And what is remarkable is how this idea of the gun, the progress that makes the old obsolete, marks the time of change in, in favor of a violent and ruthless and scary progress, is also very, very present and on the forefront here in this movie. Sorry, I've been on a monologue for a while. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think it's also interesting. You touched on something really great there in how I think uh, in Princess Mononoke, okay, the gun is also actually distinctively feminine, which is like typically against what like a lot of inter interpretation you'd find. But I think we clearly see that the gun is, is an example of female power and adaptability specifically oh, yeah. in this movie. I mm -hmm. mean, the first obvious thing is the fact that um, 
like we said, there was the scene where the samurai envoy comes and then the females, the, the all the women, they just shoot down at him with their guns. Like they don't need to engage. They could have yeah. killed them right there if they wanted to. So the gun kind of creates this equal playing field where you don't need to be a big, tough samurai guy. And even their big, tough samurai guy is kind of a useless comedy character. Like he never <laughs> gets a moment to shine. The bit where he tries to use his big, long phallic symbol sword, he misses. And then like Ashitaka just bends it and it's useless. So like and we never get the cool like samurai moment. We need to understand this context too, right? Only the samurai were were like really associated with swords. That is what empowered them. How can this class divide of like the noble samurai lords be eliminated with a fucking gun? These women use guns, thus creating yeah. more equality for them. They transcend class. They just transcend distinctions with the gun. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we're going really libertarian here, like gun rights, everyone should have gun. But yeah, this movie like equates progress uh, with to, guns. To sum, shows up, how to sum up this movie, uh, using a line from Zardos, uh, the big floating head says, the gun is good, the penis is bad. <laughs> well, yeah, that's totally what Miyazaki was thinking. I was, uh, I, I was about to say, like a, a note quote that goes... Um, uh, God created man, but Sam Cold make th made them equal. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, <laughs> fuck. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this movie does show the gun as in like equalizing forces, something that is purely in the favor of progress. And I mean, we understand. Well, like equalizing between between hu uh, humans. But yeah, it's, it's pushing uh, it's, nature away. It's specifically right. like something that overpowers and curses like uh, the the natural world. Like, like it's exactly. It's it's such an uh, like. It so increases our ability to like fight uh, well, wildlife, for example. Very typical Miyazaki iconography, by the way, with like the, uh, we had the same thing with the floating castle, right? It was like such an amazing feat, uh, like such a thing that elevates humanity, but also there's a huge ass fuck off weapon attached to it that will ruin everything. <laughs> this is always like the Miyazaki thing. There is progress and progress is always kind of corrupted by violence, by destruction. Yeah, I think this runs even deeper into the whole thing with Iron Town as well, because first of all, we see that the the lepers are actually the ones manufacturing the guns, and like they're the full craftsmanship, which is, which is another great example of uh, how these people are typically rejected by society and seen as like cast off as useless are actually making these like really effective cutting edge firearms to help them win the the fight, but also the way that because the female workers are the ones manufacturing the iron and burning the guns. It's completely changed the social strata of Iron Town to be one of, like, one that's almost a matriarchy in a sense because I really love the scene where the, the men are all sitting down eating with uh, Akatasha and um, the women are, like, have taken the, the male role in this society where they're, like, standing by the door giving shit to all the men sitting down and they're also being kind of slightly lecturous over him they're like, hey, come eat with us. You know, we'll show you a, a better time. So it's like yeah. we see this complete <laughs> gender role reversal in this scene where also the scene with the woman like giving out to her husband where like the men are almost on the lower uh, the lower part in this society, if not for a bit of a comedic effect, but still showing you how like radically different this society is. I fucking love this ambivalence so much, right? We we invest so much in Iron Town. We understand it makes people much more equal, much more happy. It gives them so much room to grow and uh, am ameliorate the differences, uh, to give a place to outcasts. And the same progress and same technology is so destructive and causes so much loss and grief. And I think this is ultimately the biggest, most important point of this movie, right? Like, we are in support of progress. However, Miyazaki claims progress will bring with it this loss and... Fuck, it's like a it's like a deadlock that is so hard to deal with. Like the movie does not have a solution, right? It says mediate, it does it says like resolve conflicts, try to like understand both sides. But that's it. Like we can only ever always keep trying to understand both sides, to see with eyes unclouded, right? But we still are kind of bound to progress. And it's so it's such an ambivalent feeling you have then towards progress and what is actually going on in the future of mankind and the sense of change of times and ah fuck. I'm I'm Kuman yeah. right now. I'm Kuman. Yeah, and that actually like feeds in really well with the ending of the movie because you can kind of see that like filmmakers they don't actually have a solution. Like it's just like okay, what Iron Town did was like um, it was good in some ways, but it was like the wrong kind of progress. This is not how you sustainably progress society. So because of that, it fails and it blows up. People survive. You know, the people survive, but. The, the buildings themselves, the community, 
uh, Iron Town itself is destroyed. It's it's not really worth preserving. Uh, is kind of what's being told. But then, what is what is the way to do it? It's it's not really being said. It's like it's really hard. It's a really hard kind of uh, thing to try and think about. And I think if anything, the ending kind of invites us to kind of like uh, keep thinking and like go on that project of how do we progress in the most uh, like considerate way possible. Like uh, Miyazaki's kind of like saying, throwing like hands up in the air. Of course, he's not the only one involved, but like um, just trying to make a metaphor here and saying like, okay, I don't know what to do here. Maybe uh, you guys can figure it out for me or something like that. At least that's what I like to imagine. Yeah, I think this particularly it's also where I found the comparisons between uh, Lady Iboshi and uh, Kushana from Norsega to be like like almost unavoidable because they're both characters who like they really want a lot and they want a lot of good change. But they kind of go about it in a way that is still like like at their folly, where they both kind of pursue this like uh, full force of like masculine strength and like dominating an opponent as opposed to kind of trying to resolve the situation. Where like it might it might be good from their perspective, but they're still kind of like pursuing this hateful way and um, not seeing the like like this. Yeah, they're not mediating between the situation. They're just like plowing ahead and just following in the same kind of mistakes that the humans before them did. Also, another side thing, I just realized that right at the end, Lady Eboshi loses her arm just like Kushana also. So like that's an extra punishment oh, for like doing bad war things that Miyazaki's keeping up there. Yeah. Uh, I I I think Lady Eboshi is such an interesting character because like uh, people have such different reads on her on, on like her, her relative like nobility, villainousness and stuff like that. I I I kind of read it as um, this. Um, I, I I know at least uh, Nyad has like like th- things like she's uh, she, she's proved uh, like m- much more like uh, uh, good than many people give her credit for. But oh, yeah. I think that there's this, but there's this one moment in um, it's it's when she's uh, when uh, she's fighting San, and there's this you see this glint uh, in her in Lady Boshi's eye, uh, this this wry smile, like she's she's enjoying it. She enjoys fighting. She enjoys uh, overpowering others and dominating, um, which I mean, uh, I mean, I like. I personally like that in a woman, but like not that way. Um, she- <laughs> I mean, I I had the sense. I mean, I see it, but also I have the sense that like she can take pride in being self sufficient and independent and like fending yeah, in, for herself in a way. But 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 I, I think it also colors her relationship with uh, with Iron Town. Like uh, like she. Um, like she, she, she didn't rescue these brothel workers or, or the lepers or the goodness of her heart. They were useful, which, like in a way, like seeing someone as useful where others see them as, as like less than useless. That, that, that there's an ability in that, but like still, like like it, it, it's a it's a sort of transaction. Like, like she does, she gets something out of them. She she like, uh, she yeah. she, she sees their their use and 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 so, exploits it where no one else no one else does. Here's my and, black and, and, and like here's her my decision black take. not to. <laughs> Return to to Iron Town like late in the movie to protect it as as she promised because she has other fish to fry. She's about to kill a god. Like I think that's such a big bit of characterization. Like look at what they actually do actively in the story. I kind of wanted to add on that a little bit because also what you see in in one aspect of Iron Town that it's like, of course, it has all these like very redeeming character traits, which makes it very sort of like progressive. But on the other hand, it's also like a very hierarchical type of town, right? You have this like huge structure in the middle of like this big pyramid, um, which kind of like reminds me weirdly of like uh, the one model they used in um, Blade Runner. I don't know why that association came to me, but it kind of like just reminded me um, where you have this huge pyramid in the middle where um, Iboshi lives, I think. I don't know, exactly know what what goes down there. No, I believe that's the ironwork building where they. Yeah, I also the big, think uh, the big building is the ironwork yeah. building. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's the ironwork. But like, it kind of like uh, signifies that there's still a lot of like, uh, sort of like very hierarchical like. Oh no, uh, question about it. Like, uh, worker uh, employer relationships going on here, and. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. 
I, but I have to say, very importantly, I think we have to understand Lady Boshi as like not motivated necessarily by a higher principle of like a, a, a human a, a, a philanthropy or whatever. She is to some extent that. But of course, also there's the rational thing of who can be useful to me. And she is an authoritarian leader. But I have to mount a strong defense here and say that the reasoning is doesn't doesn't the reasoning is rationality. It is reason. It is progress. And the funny thing I found is that uh, Lady Boshi, to me, is one of the few characters who has no scene of being consumed by hate. Everything she does is motivated by reason. It's motivated by progress. She is saving lepers and letting them work because, of course, yeah, she can get work out of them. But also, this helps restore their dignity. They are thankful. They are happy. They have something to work. They are not looked down on. They, she even builds a cute little garden for them where she keeps them safe from everyone else. And, like, the women, she's saving these women. She's making them happy. She's restoring dignity to them. Does it for us really matter that her reasoning is a transaction? Because I don't think it does have to matter. It, like, it does not invalidate a good act that it has mutual benefits. It does not invalidate a good act that it is a purely rational utilitarian calculation that is motivated by self-interest, by better betterment of outcomes for everyone involved. And this is what I think is the capacity to reason that uh, is represented in uh, Eboshi and in humans in general. That we can have reason, that we can have progress, and it will come at a cost because reason doesn't stop when it becomes difficult, when you have to sacrifice things, right? Reason doesn't stop there. Reason says, well, if it's for the progress, you're going to do it. And this is how she causes destruction. But also, like, the, I wouldn't ever use the reason in this sense to paint her as like a much more ambiguous character than than uh, 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 what the movie gives us or like a more negative character than what the movie gives us. Because not only does the movie display a, a very tactile understanding of her reasoning of her investment in her people and how deeply she cares about restoring dignity and healing her lepers even, because even when she pursues the god, she has the thought in her head that is, well, they, they, this, they, they, the, the god could heal the lepers. And when it comes to Iron Town is in danger, you should go save them. She's like, no, I trust my uh, uh, people. They can handle it. Like, this is a sense of trust. I don't, uh, uh, there might be a dimension of neglect to it, but ultimately she's still doing everything for the benefit of her community. And I think this gives us, brings us into the ambiguities of reason and rationality. But then we get into a bigger topic. Like, is there a problem with using pure reason as a basis for morality? And there might be. But I, I personally don't think there is. I mean, personally, if this is my philosophical conviction that we can do morality based off of reason entirely. Yeah, but I think Lady Eboshi's major like character flaw and why she is uh, like against the protagonist is ultimately uh, an ignorance of perspective. Uh, that's what yeah. I feel the movie tries to get across in the way that, like I said, in the she calls um, she calls San Mononoke because she believes she's kind of like possessed. She believes, oh, she just must not be like in her right mind if she thinks that I'm in the wrong somehow. She can't fathom that the wolves uh, view the forest as equally their kind of home and thing that needs to be fiercely protected. Yeah. But we also so, need to understand that San is like very explicitly identified with like not particularly rational thought processes, right? She's like wild, uh, uh, anger driven, lashes out, denies humanity uh, in herself, right? There's like there yeah, yeah, this so, kind so, of dichotomy. Yeah, so San is much more like like unhinged, you yeah. could say that Lady Boshi. But 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 I, I I don't think like composure is uh, is all that is meant by like quote unquote eyes unclouded by hatred, like. Uh, L L Lady Boshi, like, um, she keeps her composure, but, but I do believe that, that she, like, she, she hates what the, uh, the forest for, 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 for what they're doing to, to her people, to her plan. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, I, uh, the, uh, th this might be the time to mention, uh, the Innuendo, uh, Studios, uh, yeah. great, uh, great, great, uh, channel with, uh, media analysis and, uh, political, uh, essays and stuff. Highly um, recommend. Ha has this has this really uh really good uh video called uh, Lady Eboshi is wrong, where like he he gives his argument for um for why not only is Lady Eboshi in the wrong in this morally complex movie, but like Ashitaga takes a side and 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 he explains why, and uh, and you may agree or disagree with it, but I, th I think it brings brings up some interesting points, um which like the 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 core point of like why he believes Lady Eboshi is wrong, and I'm inclined to agree is if um if she left the forest alone like the, the the uh the fight would the fighting would end but if the if the forest spirits left iron town alone their forest would be like stripped mine to fuck 
and uh, so, so so they're the ones like defending themselves. So and I have to, like, to some extent disagree, right? Uh, uh, we we chatted about this a bit before. We had a yeah, yeah. little disagreement on Indiana Studios' take on this, and I disagree that this is the correct read because in in my view, we have to understand that this outsider community, the Iron Tongue community, is cast out of society and is carving their own niche into nature so they can live. If they cannot tear down the forest, they cannot get the iron, they cannot get their food, they will die. It is It is also they're in the same position of having to take in order to live. Same as the, the forest. A, yes, we can say they are kind of aggressing on the forest, but only because the way they're trying to find space to live is outside of human society. The spaces already claimed by humans are not the spaces where they can reside as the people in Irontown. Like, what, what are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to comply with the war-torn state of the shogunate, of the emperor, of the samurai bandits basically going around robbing shit, participating in feudal society. Their Iron Town is an attempt to escape that. And it is at the cost of nature, but it is also that they don't really have anywhere else to go. So the only way we can say that there's someone objectively wrong is we have some uh, pre foregun conclusion. Like if we say the forest is inherently morally valuable, whereas human community like Irontown is not, then we can make conclusions like, well, Lady Boshi is wrong. But I don't think we have any basis to make these statements. I don't think we can find the yeah, objective yeah. answer here. Yeah, I think it's also telling that... Um we get a perspective of people who who are outsiders away from like the hegemonic like sh shogun kind of control and also try to live at peace with nature and that's the imishi and that's like we see they're dying out like they're on their last leg they've got no real hope or progress so like lady boshi is kind of stuck between those two options so yeah she really has kind of no choice in her way if she wants to live in this kind of progressive style and yet somehow still live on and furthermore uh, uh, furthermore, uh, I want to say also that uh, 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 in your end studio, your second point was that, or your plate on you brought it up, that Ashitaka takes a side. I mean, okay, death of the author and everything, but let me appeal a bit for, to Miyazaki. Because he said Ashitaka wasn't able to support either side. He only wanted to save those he loved. Every moment when it seems like Ashitaka is taking a side, he's protecting those he loved. He did not participate in the onslaught of the boars on Iron Town, and he did not participate in uh, uh, um, destroying nature. He is just existing as like a mediator between two, pa two factions moving along. And yes, he was involved in restoring the head of the uh, 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 deer god, but only because it was evident that the, that the deer god's rage was a danger for everyone he loved, right? He, I don't think he is taking a side, not even symbolically. And even Miyazaki agrees. So I, I, I think it is so important to realize that reducing this film's complexity into an easy moral answer where we say someone is right and someone is wrong and we need to take a side is not what this film is about in my view. Yeah, I think there's in fact an important scene where um, where uh, Ashitaka, like there's the bit where just before Lady Boshi blows off the head of the deer god, Ashitaka throws the sword and it like sticks into the gun. Like he could have easily just like cut her head right off. He could have ended this whole thing and the deer god would probably be okay. But he like he decided up to that last moment where he's like, no, just listen to me and stop. Like he, all the way up to the, the final minute. And they all could have died right there after the deer god went like berserk and killed everything. So... Yeah, um, I um, I was about to say like uh, uh, yeah, I don't think that uh, in your end of studios uh, video like uh, m like uh, diminished the complexity. I but I, I think he made a like really good point about what our moral responsibility is when uh, when faced with an ambiguous situation. Like like that there's the, to 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 dig hard to find the uh, the right answer and and to stick with it. I mean, Which, I like, suppose you, can, you may disagree that that was that's what this movie is about, but I don't think that it's a less complex uh, take on on the moral situation. The uh, only reason I found it less complex is because he made such strong statements of who's right and who's wrong. And I think mm. it, it, it would have been like a good statement to say, uh, at some point you have to kind of take sides, or rather you are involved in it. Maybe you don't even have the luxury of taking sides, right? But um, he basically just... Uh, uh, ad hoc assumed, well, protecting nature 
is what's good. And I think this is because it's, uh, he's, he's reading it as a too simplistic environmental parable, which is something Miyazaki talked about rejecting. He doesn't like if this movie it was read as a simplistic environmental parable. But in fact, it is environmental, but it like studies the nature of relationship between civilization and nature and environmental destruction and catastrophe. And this is, this is so important. This is why I feel it reduces the complexity to some extent, because he makes for you a decision where you stand. I think you should, in this movie, make your own decision where you stand. And, and personally, I side with Ashitaka, who says, well, it might be everything fucked up, the world is curses, but you still gotta live. Ikiru. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that's uh, that, that's the big thesis statement at the end. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, so... I, I I can I can see where where you're coming from with uh, with Ashitaga taking uh t- taking that uh neutral role the the role of like non violence which is obviously like a part of his role in the story, but I can also see why you would uh why you might interpret the story as Ashitaga taking uh, the forest side especially with the uh, indigenous uh, element of the story, uh like he he might maybe like just maybe he might relate. To, uh, to to an indigenous uh, people seen as non-human by others uh, who, who get pushed out of their native land by a technologically advanced uh, adversary like, like he, he might like kind of relate to that but on the so, other hand like like uh, uh, on the other hand there's this um, idea of humanity that becomes kind of important especially as it relates to sun like so like so somehow like he like hu- humanity, means that you have to like find in in yourself to to have empathy for for these other humans even when they like hurt you and the people you love which is like a really challenging idea especially for son yeah uh, i mean i would still kind of rebut that obviously he's been exiled from the indigenous community and has seen it fade away so obviously like as a human and this is my thesis on humanity it is also this adaptability that we can find ways to live in the environment whichever direction it may go right we can find ways to live as indigenous people we can find ways to live as a wolf girl we can find ways to live (laughs) against nature in the iron town but in a sense we will live and um this is what the human aspect is and i think ashitaka cannot return to something like the indigenous community we know that he will resume to live with iron town when when after the story is over after the ending has happened we know that he does not like decide to go with san they can't live together really they can't, San can't forgive the humans, uh, as I talked earlier about Miyazaki's like statement of what he really wanted to accomplish, that they recognize they cannot live together, but they can live. Right? Yeah, um, I, I, I think what really like makes their, uh, their romance work, which like, like uh, it, honestly, in my opinion, like their, their uh, romance is a bit like matter of fact, uh, and, and like uh, to, to my taste, maybe that's just me. Uh, it, it it might be my one criticism of the movie, um, but I I think what kind of like makes it work, especially thematically, is how like they have so much more. They actually have more in common with each other than with their adopted communities. Like uh, that they're both like outsiders, uh, to, like to uh, to Iron Town and to um to to the, to the animal world respectively. Uh, but but both both adopted by uh by that both like embroiled in in a conflict that uh that kind of puts them at odds with the people they are supposed to belong to according to those people uh slash animals it's difficult to talk about this movie because some of the characters are sentient animals yeah you know yeah um, i think the romance thing just to touch on that a little is um i don't know it feels very similar to all the way miyazaki does his romances in which it's like a like a man and woman character who there's never kind of like a lovey doveyness it's like they both understand and respect each other in this way of usually it's kind of like a professional outlook like we kind of see that with kiki and tombo like tombo wanting to like like desperately pursue this thing and it's um that respect for each other really is what defines their relationship I think it's remarkable that their romance ends in absolute independence from one another and the recognition that, hey, we, we you know, we, maybe we can see each other once in a while, but we live independently in different worlds. And the main thesis is, if you love her, let her live as where she is. And that's, I think, kind of interesting, right? Like yeah. the idea that the true act of love is to let live in despite the contradictions that are between your communities. Yeah, and it's... um. There's a there's there's this uh, a, a chapter in um in in the 
big uh, book on Princess Mononoke. Uh, the, the book is called uh, Understanding Studio Ghibli's Monster Princess, and the chapter is a, is the third chapter, uh, which talks about uh, the quest for environmental balance. And they point out that like one of the um, uh, well, one of the big th- th- thematic points of, of, of the movie is uh, it, it, it's, it sort of deconstructs the the dichotomies uh, within the story. Like 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 uh, industrial versus pastoral, uh, human versus non-human, uh, culture versus nature, and I think in a way, um, Ashitaka and uh, and San their relationship like does the same. Like the whole point of it is that both like both the animals and the humans have like fixed ideas that this is what an animal is, this is what a, what a human is. The the um, the, the 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 wolf god the wolf goddess is, is like mother is like really like de- determined to say son is a wolf like shut 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 your fucking face um and, and like the ape spirits are like oh that's a human go, go away like you can be either or um yeah. like e- e- even when when you think like animal is good and she's an animal i love her you, you still have that dichotomy and the same is kind of true with uh with iron town who are like expect uh ashitaka to side with them you know no, and I, I can't constantly confused whenever he tries to de-escalate it's like who, who's whose side is this idiot on now um so so in, in a way they um like, ashitaka sort of embraces that place uh that liminal place that that in between that that like he, he tr- genuinely tries to like solve the the, the dichotomy resolve it um which san is like really hostile to like she she has really internalized the idea that she isn't like a wolf and she hates humanity. But like, uh, Ashitaka kind of like throughout the, the film proves to her that you can be human without like being an enemy to, to the forest spirits. Yeah. He's one uh, of the good ones. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think it's funny. There's also this very interesting difference. It's not really maybe a dichotomy, but kind of a difference between kind of attitudes towards maybe living whereas there's like uh the kind of very rooted segmented kind of uh ontology of of the of sun and the wolves and and but also of iron town where there's really like a strong collection to not only a certain sort of identity and form of like referencing to yourself but also a very important like territory, right? They're both like, oh, this is my territory. This is where we live. It's the forest. It's the uh, it's the town. This is where we have we we fortify this place and we stay in it till and we fight to it till we die. Uh, whereas Ashitaka, I mean, he is indigenous and a lot of like there's a lot of harmful attitudes about indigenous people that they're like really connected to nature and like. They're like intrinsically connected to the natural world in some way. I mean, he, reality, do, he does eat. He does eat the same thing that his uh, his elk does. I mean, he's kind <laughs> of like he's kind of like roaming, right? He's not really connected. Mm-hmm. To he's kind of like um, he's kind of like disconnected to any sort of formal root system or like uh, centralized something, centralized identity. He's just kind of like there and he's ready to go wherever he needs to go well part of that is he he, he has to renounce his identity with the tribe at the start of the film yeah right? of course so at that moment he he becomes like a rhizome right and that's kind of what i've been describing actually that like right yeah yeah, yeah. Um, there is kind of like this this sense of like uh kind of uh, this liminality which we've already touched on this like not having any like roots or like grounded territory to like really defend that is kind of like something noble um yeah. and i think that's um, uh, that's really uh, uh but one thing i also wanted to mention because uh, i mentioned how uh ashitaga shows uh, t- something to san about like uh you can be a human uh while still siding with with the spirits um at the same time like uh, san also ha- has like a, a sort of uh, effect on uh, on Ashitaga's perspective, like she, uh, the like part of the reason why he like re- really f- uh, f- finds this deep empathy for uh, for for the, uh, the the side of the beasts is exactly her, like like the, just just seeing her, like, like he he does like mumble in a delirium, like you're beautiful, and she's taken aback, and it's really cute. Um, 
but but but, but like there's there's something there about seeing that like even th- like th- this this child it, it it it's not essential to humans to be against beasts you know and, and it's not essential essentially beastly to be angry at at iron town like she she does prove to him that there's this middle place that he's not alone in that middle place and and that that there's some chance that that people can change their minds which is also like a really important um but I, i'm still kind of like the way he insists that she's human and shouldn't renounce her humanity i think it's it's such an important moment like right there at the end when um her wolf mother has died and the forest spirit has just been shot and everything's going to shit and she's so so angry and still wants to hate humans and he's like no you're human um if it, it feels kind of like is he denying her identity or is he like adding something to it there what so do you think? i think he's adding and i think susan napier and miyazaki world uh, has a, a, a chapter on bononoke Hime, which uh, i've been referencing non-stop but i've not explicitly made it clear but uh, yeah this is a huge source it covers a lot of what i was talking about uh, but also their her reading is that the hybridity or hybridity uh, is uh, that is caused between nature and technology is g- gives power in a sense like the boar who is cursed by the iron bullet turns infinitely like enraged and powerful as well like this power can be easily mishandled and this hybridity can become a detriment but basically most characters in this film learn of their own hybrid hybridity and uh tap into their hybridity and i think by denying her human side san would lose an element of what makes her powerful after all she is not uh, just a beast who can lash out she is someone who can talk who can uh I mean, technically fall in love with a human. She, even though her ways in which she's having a relationship with Ashitaka is quite uh, unusual. Uh, in, in the yeah, tra- sounds the real, sounds the real reverse furry in this relationship, yeah. obviously. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the thing is like renouncing the humanity in her would be to deny a part of her, the hybridity that makes her up would be to deny a part of what makes her powerful and gives her a place and, and, and an identity in the first place, right? So it's not like I identify as a wolf and he says, no, nope, fuck you, biological essentialism. <laughs> it's, it's more like, it's, it's, it's more like uh, 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 there is power and hybridity and this is what had to be recognized by most people. Like by the end of it, I mean, we talked about this before that even Lady Boshi and the Iron uh, Town people had to recognize that they are also part of nature in some sense. And this part flows through them like nobody is in full opposition to nature and nobody can be in full opposition to civilizations because if you're in full opposition to nature you will cease if you're full oppos- opposition to a uh, uh, civilization you will cease as well as you can see with the boars and the apes and everyone fucking dying all over um so hybridity is something that must be like acknowledged understood protected and to recognize oneself as part of a continuum between nature and technology somehow that's yeah, I don't think that. he like and there's any point where he like rejects her identity or it's made clear that she 100% is like trying she's she's like trying to be a wolf but it's very clear that there's these um inseparable human parts like the bit where um he falls off and then one of the wolves just goes to maul him but uh she actually like stops them and takes care of him and the, yeah the, like we said the cute moment where she's she sees that uh he says that you're beautiful or that he gives her the uh, the gem thing and she finds it very pretty. Like There's these moments that gleam through where she doesn't kind of want to admit it to herself, but there's this part of her that is like quite like traditionally like feminine and girl-like and isn't a thing that she would ever be in a typical like savage wolf mode. I mean, yeah, there's kind of like... There's kind of just like an, an antagonism in her that's kind of painted off. It's not like she... Um, it's kind of hard to talk about this, but um, it's kind of like there is there is this like difference that is always there in her that that she is like her connection to her body. She knows deep down that she's not a real wolf. She knows that she has a human form and uh, acts very often also like a human, but she doesn't want to believe it. She is in a state where she kind of uh, has like a death drive in the sense that she constantly wants to like paint over this antagonism and try to suspend it. Um, uh, and not really believe any of the th- things that are actually there. So kind of trying to deal with his antagonist and uh, and kind of 
accepting that there is more parts to her than just, oh, I'm a wolf. I was raised by a wolf. Um, I need to act as most wolf-like as possible or else I'm not a valid person. Um, that is kind of like uh, harmful to her, uh, at least that view, because she is going to keep running into this antagonism even if she doesn't want to, or tries her best not to do that. Uh, I wonder, I, I wonder I, if it's I, I reading too much second, into it. Back. Oh, okay. I was just going to say, I wonder if it's reading too much into it or... Like you can maybe um, see that, like subconsciously, San hates the humans so much because they almost like remind her of her own humanity in the way that they conflict with the wolves and are this clear force against them, and she kind of views maybe a reflection of herself in them, and that just makes her more mad that she can't be the full wolf she uh, was raised as, but like sees the human parts of them in her enemy. Yeah, I think that's actually really interesting. Um, where as you said, it's like kind of like a weird projection of saying where, like, um, where like the kind of like the the human the existence of humans is kind of the real that kind of like encroaches on her identity and like kind of reminds her that there is like you know, kind of this like uh, like antagonism in her that has to be addressed at some point, but she just doesn't want to address. Yeah, like if, if any character in, in the story has eyes clouded by hatred, it's Sun. Like, like he, even her, her like self identity gets clouded by it, um, which is part of like like the tragedy of her character. Um, but at the same time, like there's no character we have like deeper empathy for. I think like in in the in the movie, uh, to just like, yeah, again, it, it it feels tragic and sad, and like it, it that's not supposed that's not supposed how things are supposed to be. It's a it's an unnatural consequence of the conflict. And I think that's uh, part of the reason why Ashitaka like latches on to her as like this idea of like uh, if if I can save her humanity like like that that becomes a sort of stand-in for like finding this uh, place between uh, the, the, this sort of compromise where both sides have have to give something, and 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 he like he's steadfast about about it toward, uh, even like towards the giant like wolf mother threatening to eat his face. He's like. No, she's she's human, and 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 I think like even if everything here is destroyed, she'd still be human. Like like uh, it's not like she's magically tied to the land in the same way that the beasts are. Yeah, and I guess uh, while we're in the topic of hi hybridity and what it like means to these characters, we've talked a lot about San. We talked about humans playing part of nature. Let's talk about nature being human-like because we have an indistinct feature of these spirits of these huge wolves and monkeys and boars they can talk some of oh, them oh shit do. what yeah <laughs> I, didn't I didn't realize some of them can talk but some of them lose their speech and there's actually a point in the movie where it's like oh have you lost your uh, lost have you lost even your speech when moro is like looking down on on, on the huge uh gray boar and the monkeys can barely speak. They speak like very uh, poor grammar and uh, uh, they're slurring. You have the sense of that these animals, like Ashitaka's tribe, which fades away and has kind of become obsolete, the speech of these spirits is also fading. Like their, their spiritual property, that kind of magic that gives them speech and sovereignty and existence and makes them more human-like because they can communicate. And it's interesting that they can. Fades when, when, when they're like challenge when they are clouded by hatred the boars lose their speech when their mind is clouded by hatred so it's not just that humans clouded by, are clouded by hatred and thus deny parts of themselves or destroy ruthlessly the nature it is also that we have kind of like a, 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 a nature spirits which we can in a sense understand as like a distinct axis of nature itself because the deer god cannot speak this is more like nature as such and spirituality and animism which is like central to Shinto is more embodied in the speaking spirits in my view and that they fade that they die out is in my sense like um, an interesting fact about hatred again but I'm, I'm trying to think if like we can put it like in a bigger picture because I'm kind of struggling to fully read it myself um, I really thought that the animals being able to speak again like portrayed it and again like I was saying about the whole like it being like an epic fantasy is like each side of this is um, fully given um kind of a empathetic oh shit what, what am i trying to say they're kind of given um uh, 
an emotional re- like reality to them and they're all made to be empathetic and like have a point like we say with the wolves and the boars and they can all be equally like stupid and uh, single-minded but also like intelligent and like clearly fighting for things they believe in so i think that's why like specifically they get speech to make them human and make them um like proper like moral actors in this as opposed to just being kind of wild beasts to do whatever you know and then make them kind of yeah, othered that, to the uh, audience that's, that's probably like one of the like technical reasons why uh they they, they 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 speak like like we we need to understand them like we need to be able to facilitate dramatic dialogue but i think like the, the deeper the thematic stuff um and, and this goes to something like uh Rewatching it, I, I was kind of like reminded of like the greatness of uh, of J.R. Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings. I think this is the same like Miyazaki is kind of doing the same thing with Japanese mythology as uh, as Tolkien was was doing with um, n- like not only drawing directly from it, but 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 like uh, using it, using it uh, to to like tell a story to capture some sort of uh, primordial truth of the of the the mythology. Uh, both like are obviously really interested in mythology as a subject, um, and and I think I think it's pretty interesting that Miyazaki is, is like u- using the uh, using imagery where Tolkien was more interested in words. Kind of, like might might actually be uh, one of the core like uh, artistic differences between uh, Japan and England. Like uh, very like nature imagery versus you know wordiness and language. Um, but but I digress. Um, what, what what really struck me was this specific idea, which again it starts out with this once once upon a time, back in ancient times, there was the there were these amazing forests where the gods lived. Oh fuck yeah! But but it faded over time, like like it it, it got cut down, it faded, and we have this idea throughout the, the film from small like little lines like like how the boars have grown smaller and soon they'll just be yeah. like game for the hunters. We grow small hunters. and stupid, soon we will be nothing but game. Exactly. Like, like uh, uh, Tolkien's fantasy had the same uh, through line, except it's it's more with like civilizations. Like the once upon a time, like the, there, there were these great figures. Like uh, it, it's actually like kind of biblical in a way. Like once upon a time, things were, magic was stronger, things were purer, but over time, Everything has faded to, to to the point where, you know, all the elves are going off to uh, to the sea, and uh, in this case, all, all the animals are like either losing the forests that are holy or just losing their, their their greatness over time. And I think it's such an interesting angle to take on that uh, epic fantasy concept of, you know, great magic fading because it's directly tied to to the land in that uh, classical Shinto way. It's like like. It's true, actually, as a matter of fact, that there were these like ancient forests uh, that 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 were just so huge and so alien to us today. Because, uh, as mentioned before, so much of the landscape has been reshaped by uh, by humanity. Um, and and just the only thing you add there is, oh, there were also beast spirits that were tied to the land in that way, and 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 so the fading of that greatness becomes a sort of fading of of nature fading of the land um and, and, and like the the way that culture is directly tied to the land is such an important part of uh, uh of uh, miyasaki's work and of like uh japanese identity in general like so much so much about like nature and mountains and and animals yeah uh, an important thing i think um i can't believe we didn't bring it up earlier but uh, the deer god is very clearly at the, uh, the like the nexus point of all these things where uh, its design is that of like a big deer, but it has a human face. And I believe it was initially kind of supposed to have like trees as antlers. It's, it's kind of weird in the movie, but it is this thing where like, yeah, it's a total idea of nature because like we said, like humans are part of nature and they can't escape it. They can't other it completely. So the deer god in kind of being this neutral figure of like life and death and like the totality of the natural world that like is a is inevitable it has like human features it doesn't speak because again it still kind of remains neutral but it has this distinct uh, other quality to it while all the other animals and spirits are like clearly like animals the deer god is something like completely other a mix like a chimera of all of them yeah full hybridity and also um yeah 
Oh, no, never mind. I'm done here. Full hybridity. <laughs> Full hybridity all the yeah. way. Okay. Um, should we then just talk about the ending? And wrap yeah. It up? yeah. I, I think, think so. we can get all loose ends that we have when we talk about the ending, which, by yeah. the way, goes into the Dear God. I mean, we have uh, to understand, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, as to what the motivations are to try and kill the Dear God, to get his head. And my uh, initial like points were like we assume like the dear god to be this like neutral, omniscient like metaphysical instance of like life and death itself and nature as a concept embodied in like one body like all of nature and all of the parts of nature which are also humans and trying to encroach on nature trying to find immortality there like the emperor does is uh, where you can go too far because death is what we all will face and that is kind of my takeaway from the end but i think there's more in there and i'd be curious but, to hear your takes yes i also think it was not only the emperor who went too far but also i know you've defended iron town before but also iron town i think that for all its like positive elements i think that ultimately the text of the film is not saying that uh Iron Town is something that is to be preserved or like a sustainable way of like um progress. Um uh, uh again there's not like any like um alternative there but uh there is like this sort of like sense of progress here is not really sustainable according like and and it's like logical why because like they're trying to wipe all the forest so JK they can just like degradate the environment and get all the iron out of it. Um, and it's not even the fact that it's just destroying nature. It's also the fact that as a cause for progress, it's not a good way of progressing because at a certain point, you're going to come at a point where you're no longer able to progress because you've exhausted all of these resources, right? Um, so... Because of that, I think Iris Town had to end in failure because I guess it was kind of premature in the film, but eventually Iron Town was going to go to failure anyways because their sense of progress just wasn't sustainable. Yeah, the, the, uh, there's an infinite iron in those hills. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that is kind of like where all of these like different, things go uh where it's, it's it's kind of like there is a lot of tension in this film it's a very tense film and that is because there's so many different antagonisms that are going on and by the end they are kind of resolved in a way but also in a way that that can be like kind of the groundwork for something new um i think there's two kind of readings of the ending that are both very viable and i'm not like sure how to I think about it just yet because um there's a lot of talk about this film being like a very cyclical kind of right because like a thing a big thing that's very different in Japanese kind of uh uh history and like philosophy I guess is that there's a very like cyclical way of thinking whereas in the West uh generally speaking I don't want to orientalize here we have a more like progressive, like at least when we're thinking about our philosophy of how history functions, we have a more progressive idea. I mean, it, it's the whole Buddhist uh, idea of re reincarnation is also um, a part so of it. So the end of the film kind of symbolizes that of like a sort of reincarnation, but it's not like a true reset. It's more like uh, a house burns down and then uh, the ashes kind of form a new sediment on which something new can be built. Um, it's a way where um, there's Conflict a sort of will also repeat, right? it, but something that was before that is still preserved and can be learned from so that a new sort of better future can be created so it's Shout kind of from my boy Hegel yeah it, it, it's very Hege I think a, a Hegelian film a Hegelian analysis of the film would be very apt um, in this sense, which is maybe a hot take, maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's still very debatable uh, whether or not this film is like, very, I think maybe it's more of a combination where it's like, it's a cyclical sort of development, but kind of cyclical in a way where it kind of like becomes something new and becomes like, I don't know. 
yeah, every cycle adds a dimension. Lady Boshi learns something by the end uh, and wants to rebuild Iron Town, but not in the same way. However, to me, it is evident that the wheel of progress, when it turns, will grind some gears and will fuck over nature somehow in the progress. So it will re return, but in a different way. As each era passes by us, we have new progress and new challenges to nature. And the thing is, I mean, nature has already lost a huge thing, like spirituality ends. Miyazaki makes this film to represent an era where these forest spirits disappear and only remain like in the hearts and souls of the Japanese. <laughs> yeah, speaking of philosophy, God is dead and they killed him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they did it. Oh, yeah, I was going to reference that exact quote from Miyazaki where he says, like, the spirit of these forests in this kind of time, like, can now only exist, like, in the Japanese people, like, looking back on it, and it's kind of been totally lost. Like, very clearly, the um, the dear god dying at the end and not just being fine once you give him his head back, but, like, he, he's properly dead, like, symbolized that so much. And then, of course, the last shot of the movie is, like, the forest clearing with the single little uh, Kadona. Is that what they're called? Kodama. 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 That's it. Yeah, that's just, such a just great one of them. Oh, yeah. Just one little one of them. Because as we saw before, there were like millions in the forest. There and you like don't thousands. know if he's the only one left alive or if he's new and it means that the forest will return or something like nature will return. You don't yeah. know. I love and the it's ambiguity. such a great ambiguity. But it's cute. Yeah. It is there and it rattles and it's cute. I like it. I, th I, I think of it, I, I think of kind of uh, the ending like, like this. Um, like mentioned before, there's a lot of blood in this movie. A um, lot, lot of dead people, a uh, lot, of, lot of killing, a lot of, um, yeah, a, a lot of bile and blood and, uh, and, 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 and cursed uh, goo weirdness. Um, like the, the, we, we, we watch a god bleed in, in, yeah. in this movie. Um, but I think like at, at the end, at the end of it, um, it's not like the wounds, Di retroactively didn't happen it's it's not like everything goes back to normal yeah like ashitaka the, the, also but, has scars still from the curse exactly that, that, that's exactly what, what i'm uh the, what, what, where i'm going like it there's uh the land is scarred but but like yeah. the the wound is is healed the scar remains and like the uh the uh, the, the scar remains so it, it it's not like it's not cyclical in the same way that like yeah oh it's just new soil and then it can grow no no like the, the wounds have a permanent effect and you can't keep doing the same thing there because like yeah. then eventually the arm will fall off i mean yeah. I, I might be stretching the metaphor here, no but... yeah i get it absolutely yeah, and, and, and also yeah and, Fuck, it, that's great and and, and it, it again ties back to this uh the, to, to this great fantasy concept of uh uh, the the ep epic fantasy idea of uh, of fa fading magic uh, and yeah. and oh, ancient fuck. greatness that 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 disappears over time, um, which uh, again the the forest god disappears after one last like incredible miracle and everyone who saw that would be like holy shit, like even Ibo Lady Boshi is changed by that experience it, it seems at least, but like you can't have that happen every time th this conflict uh, flares up. I actually, yeah. I actually think it's so powerful, Hipster, that you randomly, like, maybe as a joke brought up, like a Nietzsche quote, God is dead. But I also think this movie is deeply dealing with a loss of spirituality, tying into what Platon just described. When we see the lonely Kodama at the end, we need to remember Miyazaki saying that he kind of likes the idea of these useful, useless things in nature existing just for their own sake, just something we can admire and like be in awe of, and like these deep forests where we suspect creatures. This entire movie describes how it is sort of almost inevitable that this will disappear that as we progress as we make sense of the world around us we demystify the world spirits disappear because we have rationalized the world we have come to understand nature not as something that exists in itself but something that exists for us that we can make use of we remove the spirits by not being able to see these spirits in the world anymore because we do not have this appreciation the sense of what nature is anymore and this is not judged he's not saying it's terrible that that we don't have the sense of nature anymore because you're terrible people but it's kind of like implied that the, the spirits will fade away and this is the whole like conundrum of like progress and rationality disenchants and demystifies the world and allows us to explore and progress and um, cultivate and make ours but when nobody is and nowhere has any space for any secret anymore, this also is like a deep rift for spirituality. There's nothing 
to be in awe of anymore. There's nothing we can fantasize about and mystify and, and make wonderful stories about. There's no, let's say, like we find like a little secluded shrine somewhere in the woods, like in Totoro, some like some stuff like this, right? And imagine this all fading away, like the sense that there could be something living there, something magical, something wondrous. And this is like kind of the entire movie is mourning this as it is depicting its inevitability. And this is for me like one of the central themes also going on here. But I also think um, it's funny that you point that out. Um, I also have kind of a more positive take on it because like in a sense, um, the film itself is kind of an attempt to kind of recreate some of that self, right? Not in the same way that it was there before, but like I think Miyazaki is also kind of celebrating the art form by doing this because while the this this ability of us to create fantastical stories and narratives and things have disappeared, the progress itself has also kind of um, created better opportunities for us to kind of make uh, make make new versions of these stories in this in the forms of, for instance, in animation because. Uh, it's this is a very fantastical movie, and there's lots. Uh, there's a very fantastical film, and there's lots of other films and art forms out there that this that kind of come into this fantastical and amazing realm that maybe he's talked about that couldn't be created before certain technologies are were developed. So while it is probably uh, a shame and it's, it's cause for mourning that uh, these kinds of like little natural natural like folklore and uh, spirituality is lost we now also have an alternative in which we can ex kind of explore the same sort of uh, side of our creativity and um, uh, longing for storytelling but in a very different way that is also very satisfying and very valid and valuable in its own right well I, I kind of agree, but on the other hand, like, have, have you seen The Wind Rises? Because that's that movie is is also mourning that very like uh, creativity in a uh, oh yeah it, yeah oh, just fuck, like world. Yeah. incredible maybe, point. Maybe fuck, this yeah, is which something, uh, this is not maybe something that's directly lifted from the text of the film itself or even the artist's intentions. It's more like it's thought. your personal take. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, think, I, yeah. I, I agree with it. Like, as art is like the substitute, like creation as the substitute for spirituality. But yeah, holy shit, played when you brought it up. Like Miyazaki also kind of thinks seems to deal with this topic and to see how even art and creation itself is caught up in history and pain and suffering and grief and yeah. loss. Holy yeah, fuck! And, uh, the Wind Rises is gonna be an amazing cast, by the way. Oh yeah, everybody and, uh, subscribe and thought... to stay tuned for us. To Wind Rises <laughs> yeah, in a year. one day. Um, I, I think the wind rise is also an interesting uh, uh, point to bring up because it, it's another one of uh, Miyazaki's most serious films, and it also like deals with moral ambiguity, complexity, and has kind of the same conclusion, although stated in a more like a much sadder way, like that that you have to live. That that's uh, and and that's the bottom line. That yeah, even, even like you get you get out on the other side of these. Uh, these huge uh, conflicts uh, of life and death of uh, of who who gets to decide what to do with uh the the land that's been given uh the, to us but like at the end of it of it all uh it, it's it's all about finding a way to uh, to live in it with yourself and with others um yeah and that, that that's the kind of the, the note uh, the film ends on um and and, and I, th I think there's this what really makes this movie not just like a, a, um, a masterpiece of animation and cinema, but like fantasy is the way it really evokes that, uh, that idea of old magic and re completely recontextualizes the mythology of the, of the culture that created it. That, that That's to me what like the best kind of fantasy is. It's, it's exploring like what mythology once was uh like it, it, it but it, it from a modern perspective in a way it, it is hard to uh formulate i think it's hard to put yes, into words i agree and i suggest that you know on the topic of what you brought up of like the point being to live i have one little anecdote about uh, 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 
and then an, an occurrence in Miyazaki's life that inspired him a lot to include certain themes in this film. And maybe we can end on this anecdote because I think it like really ties into some of the like beautiful life affirming side of this film, unless someone else has not something to interject. Anecdotes are stupid. Let's just talk about Hegel, all right? <laughs> So when when it comes to uh, rationalizing and demystifying nature, I feel like we didn't uh, at all touch on perhaps the most important character to this, and one of the major characters uh, that's Jiko the monk, who exists as like the uh, the crony of the emperor, who who's kind of inciting a lot of these events. That wants the the dear god, and he's like promised Eboshi like several protections or something if she can deliver the 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 dear god's head. And he's a, an interesting character because in Miyazaki in one interview said he kind of wanted to portray him in a way where he's not like malicious. He's not like a bad person. He's quite friendly and helpful. Just he's kind of like the modern Japanese sal salary man that will just do his yeah. job. <laughs> and he doesn't actually care about anything that he's doing. He just is right. dedicated to doing it. And so he views this whole like situation as completely uh, morally uh, black and white like he does his job and that's what he does and he like fiercely defends the head right up until like the last moments they have to be surrounded by like a miasma of death seconds away from being killed before he even gives up and says all right take the head like he's like this really swift defender of this uh hegemonic culture that is represented by the shogun and like like we said the uh, larger japanese ethnic group i can't disagree i, I think jigobo is uh like f fu fundamentally uh, as, as, as about all about self-preservation like he, he's like the least hateful probably the least hateful character in, in the in the whole movie he, he doesn't he doesn't really give a shit like like he he he, he shelters uh Ashitaka. he's he's a bit curious about him like uh what, what's what's this dude's deal but like he, he but like he if he cared so much about the emperor he, he wouldn't help Ashitaka out knowing that he's this part of this indigenous tribe that the emperor has uh, banished um and he he and, and as, as you mentioned, uh, he he spends like the uh, climax of the film, like protecting that head until it's not in his in self interest anymore. Like like until it, it doesn't like until he's about to die, and he's like, ah, well, just take it. And he just like heads off at the end. And I, I, th I think uh, he's a very interesting figure in that way. Like many people have pointed out that he's the closest thing to an actual like real villain in, in the story, who's like. Uh, motivations aren't noble in any way but at the same time like he's he, he also seems the most neutral in in, in some yeah, that's, other that's what way. i was saying like he's this completely like neutral party yeah that pretty much again he just like follows the orders of this so, like hegemonic force yeah. in the world and he doesn't question it at all he just is like well all right and he's yeah he's very self-preserving in that instinct yeah. in the way that he's just hired to do a job and that's his best interest so yeah, I mean, if, if we if we want to locate the morality of like characters, we have like uh, uh, a lady Boshi being hugely utilitarian. We have like the nature side, which is very like uh, uh, deontological of like the ha principles of nature should not be harmed. And then you have Jikobo, who's like an egoist. <laughs> He's like, okay, no, yeah. Jikobo, I just no, Jikobo is like an existentialist. Jikobo is like an existentialist. Like, oh, that's compatible with egoism. Yeah. Come on, like <laughs> he's actually one. I, I, I learned to Ashitaka point. because he's interesting to me. That that's like what I would say, right? That that's what he did. He looks cool. He looks interesting. He has mean, gold. Yeah. Let's talk to him. Yeah, I, th I think Jigabo's like whole th th thing. Like he, he's one of the like characters who really like has like th uh, a philosophy. You know, has thought it through, and is, and and his conclusion is like, oh, e everything's gone to shit. So just look out for number one. Which I mean, I mean. Yeah, it's he a philosophy. Has, like, <laughs> yeah. What I mean with that is like he has a sort of like on right? He's like, uh fuck it. Like everything is kinda going to shit, so I'm not like like attaching to myself to anything like that's like above like my own level is not really worth it. Um because I'm just gonna get tangled up in this like huge war of ideology, so I'm just gonna like try to keep like kind of a low profile and just watch out for my own self interest kind of yeah he he's the only character who lies i think like he's the only character who to, who like st straight up like is yeah is, is duplicitous yeah but like, i everyone think that's really important about. again like i was saying the whole dis um demystifying nature thing where um it, it very important is his design because he's dressed up as a monk like a symbol of spirituality and like a dedicated like order and idea of like communing with the spirit and that's like very important to people he merely uses it as a disguise like he just tosses it away 
just as this thing that he helps him kill people and like uh, accomplish his goals more efficiently. The same way they also kill the bulls and then just skin them and use them as as cloaks. Right, that's such like a disturbing these, sequence. These, these fantastic mythical creatures that like are part of like the life of the forest. They just like would no without hesitation just kill them and skin them and then move on to the next thing. Like it's just all part of uh, what they're doing. Like pure practicality in the kind of Lady Eboshi way. But like they don't at all consider the uh, spiritual nature of any of this. Yeah, like m- most of us default to being uh, Jigobo, and we should strive to be Ashitaka. And yeah, the rest. I, I kind of that is what Miyazaki says as well. Like he equated, like this is Miyazaki quote as Hipster said. Like he's uh, kind of equated to like the regular Japanese everyday salary man, and not just salary man, but like like the normal person. He, Miyazaki agreed that most people are kind of like Jigobo in a sense, but you know, uh, yeah. Ashitaka is supposed to kind of give us a, a different perspective on this to look beyond just mere self-interest and self-preservation. Yeah, also, like, quick side note on uh, Jigobo. I love the little background characterization uh, at, the, at the start of the story where he uh, he helps uh, shelter uh, Ashitaka and, like, um, combines uh, Ashitaka's rice with his stew to, so, like, they have dinner. And, like, they're, they're having that conversation and Jigobo is just, like, spooning it up and like uh eating all uh, eating all of it up like he he yes he he's he's like he's he's kind of like generous but like he he's he's also a glutton and he's not even ashamed of it so like a, he'll ta- he'll take whatever a you give him, like unashamedly yeah yeah and, and and he has this philosophy that everyone else is the same way which is really what makes him a kind of it's insidious character like we don't really like him because he assumes everyone else is on the same level that's why he like lies to lady eboshi with a straight face and when she calls him out he's like oh well you got me but you know what can you do yeah that's what it is <laughs> all right wonderful okay we covered the most important character of the film um no 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 we haven't covered the most important uh, the, uh which is uh yakul the elk like oh. who else best uh, represents our, tr- our trusty boy, our yeah. beloved elk? That uh, oh even though God. he gets freed from his reins, he still stays by his boy. Uh, yeah, I mean, who guy, who in this dude. movie is in a more like liminal space between nature and humanity? Huh? He's a d- domesticated uh. animal who like uh, who who is loyal to uh, 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 to his mother to the end, and also, um, uh, I think I kind of lost the plot there. Oh yeah, he also like uh, he yeah uh, he uh, is is such so blessed to to like meet the the, the elk, uh, the, no meet the meet the great deer god. Like that's got to be a big experience for for for, for, for old, uh, old Yakul. Um, there's one thing about the lepers that I uh, read. I think it wasn't Miyazaki, but I'm not sure about it right now. But uh, they were actually included because um, yeah, Miyazaki was thinking about what could he add to the movie. And he had this, um, I forget what this place was called, but it, there was a, I would call a station in front of his house. And he visited the la- leper people and saw the misery that they had, like yeah. these outcasts. And that's why he actually put the lepers into the movie. Yeah. So this is actually literally what I wanted to end on this anecdote oh. that Miyazaki visited a leper sanatorium. And and here's what he has to say about it. Like in Turning Point, there's like a quote. In the middle of no matter what kind of misery, there's joy and laughter. In human life, which tends towards ambiguity, I've never seen a place which shows this with such, with such certainty. Because he was so deeply impressed by seeing the uh, lepers in the leper sanatorium being happy, laughing, uh, living. And this is so central to this movie, if we think about it. Like, I love that you brought it up, Max. And yeah, I think this summarizes the themes of the film in a sense, right? Human life tends towards ambiguity, but despite all the misery, there's joy and laughter. Live. Ikiro. Yeah, as, as the posters for the movie said. Yes. The posters. Are, oh, we didn't even mention it in, in the cast as of yet. But yeah, the movie promotional posters literally just have one word on them, like next to the, uh, obviously, like the iconography of the film and like the, the picture. It is Ikiru, live. Very simple thesis for such a complex film. Holy shit. Well, that's really what makes many of, of, of his films so uh, so engaging. That That's also, that's what makes a good a- a action adventure or any kind of 
film that there has to be some kind of certainty. There has to be something we can take away from it and not just something we have to interrogate. It can't be all mystery and ambiguity. There is an ambiguous, like, goodness in, uh, in, in people and in nature in this movie. And there's, like, an unambiguous answer to what are we supposed to do. I mean, well, we're supposed to live and, like, what form that takes depends entirely on, like, who we are and what we value. Beautiful. I say uh, we call it a podcast for now because, wow, this is a long one. This is the longest one. I wonder if we'll ever make a longer one in this uh, in this Nausicaa series. But for now, let's get to the Maybe closing. Maybe Spirited Away. Maybe Spirited Away. Holy shit. Maybe Wind Rises, actually. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I think so, that Spirited Away would be the longest one. Maybe. But I want to I want to conclude now on give uh, on, on doing the usual spiel at the end. But I also have a little announcement because while talking about this movie and now stretching the podcast length to like more than three hours, I'm gonna have to say I still have something to talk about in this movie, which is a bit more elaborate. And I, I think I would have like just had monologue for like fifteen or twenty minutes in this podcast if I had delivered this take. But I'm gonna hype it up because I think I'm just gonna make that a video like that will come up in the next couple of weeks let's say because i want to trace the themes and do comparisons between princess mononoke and uh, uh, antigone by sophocles which is like greek tragedy and i'm all right there blowing... was a text we read for yeah, about yeah. It. exactly too uh, which i thought wasn't fleshed out enough so i'm actually gonna do like some I'm, I'm going into the woods i'm gonna talk to my professor because currently in my semester i have a class which is called versions of antigone which is uh, concerned with like reading and rereadings and rewritings of antigone through the times and this is so fitting because mononokohima fits so perfectly on this formula that i really want to trace these differences and similarities in a more detailed fashion i think it a and understanding of Mononoke Hime substantially. But I have not the time nor the research done that to develop it here. I'm just going to hype it up and tell everyone who likes this cast and wants some more interesting takes on, hopefully interesting takes on Mononoke Hime, that's going to come up. Yeah, we, we, should, we should probably have, um, we should probably ha- have like st- started this, uh, th- this episode out just acknowledging this is like the most texts on like any of the films we've talked about yet. Like, like there's, there was no way we could like read all the interesting stuff that has been written uh, about this, and there's also like v- very unlikely that we had any like genuinely original takes here. So, uh, like, damn, th- like this movie is like a big one. Like, uh, it, it, it really is. Like, there's so- some of the episodes we had like jack shit to to look into because no one really uh, has, has like had any academic thoughts about it. But this one was just a treasure tro- trove. Oh, yeah. Entire books about this. And other than that, thanks for listening to the Narsicast. Uh Also, check out our Discord server. We, we can discuss the films or anything else you want. And maybe consider supporting our mic quality or new thing. Help us pay the bills for getting this podcast hosted on all the nice podcasting sites by giving us your money on Patreon. On patreon.com slash Narsicast with a double A. N- no umlaut. Links are all in the description. And... Next time, we're going to talk about a much lighter film. At least I hope it's going to be much lighter for us. Who knows what we find when we start researching and rewatching the film. Because next up is My Neighbors the Yamadas, which is a cute little film about family by Isao Takahara. And let's see if that's going to be breather. We really need it after this beast of a film. So uh, I guess we'll see. See you guys next time. Until then, goodbye. Yeah, and remember, live. Live! Live. Live. Ikuru.